Good evening. This is the January 21st, 2020 meeting of the Exeter Zoning Board of Adjustment. I'm Joanne Petito. To my left is Bob Pryor, Laura Davies, um, Chris Merrill, Rick Theobar, Kevin Baum, and Esther Olson Murphy. Um, I we have a lengthy agenda tonight, so I want to make sure to mention that we do not take up new matters past 10 p.m. So at 10 o'clock, we will, once it becomes 10 o'clock, we'll continue and finish the matter that we're addressing at that time, but we won't take up anything new after that. Um, in addition, one of the matters, in one of the matters, the applicant has asked to postpone um, their application due to the lengthy agenda. It's case number 20-3, Magnolia Lane Tax Map 65, Lot 147. Exeter Hospital application variants. Um, they've submitted a letter that says due to the lengthy agenda this evening and the possibility that we may not be reached prior to 10 p.m., we respectfully request that this matter be continued. Please reschedule this matter to the board's February 18th, 2020 agenda. And that's submitted by their attorney, Sh Sharon Summers. So this matter will be rescheduled for February 18th. So if anybody is here on that matter, you should know that we're not hearing that this evening. Okay. So we'll proceed with the first item on the agenda. Yes. Offer somebody at the bottom of the list the opportunity to reach all I guess we could. The, there's been a, anybody who, any applicants who would like to reschedule can suggest doing that at this time if you're down at the bottom of the agenda okay so we'll just proceed then in order the first matter is the application of brian grissett for an appeal from an administrative decision made by the building inspector code enforcement officer on january on october 30th 2019 relative to the interpretation that the zoning board of adjustment relief would that zoning board of adjustment relief would be required for the proposed single family open space development being presented to the planning board for review. The subject properties are located on New Hampshire Route 111, Kingston Road, and Tamarind Lane in the R1 low density residential and NP neighborhood professional zoning districts. Tax map parcels number 96. Dash 15, number 81 dash 57, and number 81 dash 53. It's case number 19 dash 17. Um, actually, before we begin discussing that matter, we I should mention that we did have a, a requ request for a recusal. Do yes. we want to address that? Um, yes, yeah. Um, Kevin, is it? Yeah, so yeah, what the um. <coughs> Uh, one of or several of the abutters have sent in a letter asking that I recuse myself um, because I uh, represent my firm and I, I also represent the Rose Farm development um, that was mentioned in the application. Um, I've re reviewed the application and, and um, it, what my understanding, I know that it was mentioned, these were none of the issues that are raised in this application are currently under appeal. I don't rem recall them being issues in that application, um, and I don't see any need to recuse myself. Um, I would certainly entertain discussion if others on the board uh, wanted to, but um, but based on my review of the request and my review of the three applications, um, I didn't I didn't see any basis. Yeah, I, I in just in looking at what was submitted, I didn't see any basis either and um, the fact that the issues the issues here are not on appeal in that matter and they're separate matters I don't see a reason for that and I assume you feel that you can be impartial that's correct yes. anything else who are the voting on members that? on this case oh yes we start. and um, there was another Esther did you want to bring something regarding I had, the yeah. I was active with the Rose Farm as well but I think I can be unbiased in this case too because they're different situations okay so we have a full we have how many people how many of us are there one two three four five six seven um the regular members will be voting on this matter 
can we have one or two alternates as well voting? No, no, just five. Just five. Just five. So the alternates can participate in the deliberations, but won't be voting. On Who are the alternates? Chris. And Chris and Esther. Oh, you're an alternate. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. So you can participate in the discussion. You feel that? The okay. 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 All, all right. right so. Okay. So with all of that, would the applicant like to proceed? Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chairman, members of the board. My name is Justin Passe from Donahue, Tucker, and Chandel in Portsmouth here tonight on behalf of the several applicants to include Brian Grisette, Adela Grisette, and uh, the Mendez Revocable Trust. And for ease of purpose, I think I'll probably just refer to them as the Grisettes because for functional purposes and certainly for these applications, they are one and the same. Uh, I'm joined tonight by uh, Christian Smith from Beals Associates as well as Jim Goh from Gove Environmental and Brian White from White Appraise Appraisal. Uh, each of whom will have roles in our presentation tonight. And as, as you noted, we're really here on three applications, an appeal of an administrative decision made by uh, uh, Doug Eastman, a variance request, and a uh, special exception request. And all of those applications relate to the same underlying proposal, which is uh, a 16-unit open space residential development proposed by the Grisettes off property they own uh, uh, off of essentially 111 Kingston Road and Tamarind Lane. Um, our proposal, my proposal, uh, should it please the board, is to provide essentially uh, a substantive presentation up front um, that will include an, an overview, a, a bit of a context for uh, the development and, and where we are in 2020 vis-a-vis -vis the beginning of the plans for this open space development, which really began in 1991. I'd then like uh, Christian Smith to just get up and go through the process that we've undertaken so far, uh, our trip to the planning board, and really the primary issue in this case, which is the yield plan, which is uh, the subject of the request uh, for administrative <coughs> appeal, and the yield plan is the basis for both the variance that we've requested and the special exception that we've requested as well. And the way that I see this working well, excuse me, before I get there, I'd like uh, Jim Gove's going to stand about afterwards and give sort of a perspective from a wetlands conservation perspective on the property in question. Um, and then I think the best idea here is for the board to take up the administrative appeal first and to do a, uh, uh, do a full public hearing and then close up public hearing and deliberate because based on how the board acts in that case, uh, we'll pursue one of two courses of action thereafter. If the board denies our appeal of Doug's uh, decision, then we will pursue a, a variance uh, to allow what Doug has characterized as the, the transfer of density from one lot that the Grisettes own to another where the actual development will occur. And if the board grants our appeal, then we will pursue what we think is the only relief that we need to show uh, the, the yield plan as it exists today, which is a special exception to, uh, to show on a yield plan a residential use which is permitted by special exception in the underlying zoning district which is uh, the neighborhood professional zone um, so that's what my proposal is up front um, I'm happy to answer questions at this juncture I can just do up my quick overview here before turning things over to Christian I was just wondering you said you would have a brief presentation by the environmental mm -hmm. consultant is that relevant to the appeal for the administrative decision if not it should probably be delayed to that we, we uh, certainly um, I think it's relevant insofar as it relates to why the, the yield plan exists in the form that it exists today. And it, it relates to the amount of wetlands and the uplands on the property too. Okay. Um, so to just start with the, with the context and really the message that we're hoping to convey here is that um, this has been a long process. It's been a very deliberate process that began in 1991. Brian Grisette is a developer. He's developed uh, hundreds of residential units over the last several decades in several subdivisions. And in 1991, he purchased at a foreclosure sale a big piece of property off of Kingston Road and Tamarind Lane, which was the remaining land of the Meadows subdivision. And that big piece of property included several sort of dis pieces of property, which are distinct now. And that includes the Grisette's actual property where they live off of Cullen Way, that's 26 Cullen Way, that's 23.6 acres. That site is also the site of the proposed open space development. If you're looking at that uh, yield plan, you can see um, what is proposed to be a subdivision road um, and the uh, sort of center of the plan. On the bottom left is a cul-de-sac, that is Cullen Way. 
Um, and essentially the whole left side of that plan is the Grisette property, the 23.6 acre pro property. <coughs> the piece of property that he purchased in 1991 also included uh, the property that is now the Greybridge Circle subdivision, which was uh, permitted in 1993. It's an eight lot subdivision with a 500 foot uh, subdivision road off of, off of Kingston Road. And then the last piece of the property that he purchased in 1991 uh, is what is now town property uh, off of Kingston Road where the recreation fields are. It's about 9.4 acres. So again, in 1991, Mr. Grisette and his wife purchased that large swath of property and almost immediately got to developing Greybridge Circle. Um, and that property, again, was an eight lot subdivision. It was permitted in 1993 and is in 94. Uh, the good thing about having your client right next door to you is that he can pull you down by the collar and correct you. Um, part of that permitting process included an agreement by Brian and his wife, Addie, to, to convey to the town what is the town recreation fields now. It's 9.38 acres. And so they went under contract. There's an agreement that I provided to you in our package. And part of that agreement is we will give this to the town, but we will retain for the purposes of future development on the very land, which is the subject of the plan today, uh, the density rights. So they entered agreement with the town. They provide this open space to the town and they, the town agrees in return that when you go develop the very property that we are trying to develop now, you can count in your density calculation for an open space development these 9.38 acres. So that's the context of the, of the uh, permitting for Greybridge Circle in 1994. At that same time, 1993, Brian and his wife purchased the property which is now 5 Tamarind Lane. That property is proposed on our conceptual site plan and on our, you can see it on the subdivision plan as well, excuse me, on the, on the yield <coughs> plan as well. That property has a 75 foot right of way over it, which is proposed as the access. Justin, you mean eight Tamarind? It's, it's, it's correct, you're right. It's, it was lot five in the subdivision of, uh, of itself, but it's eight Tamarind Road um, <coughs> Lane. And that property now has a 75 foot right of way. So in 1993, when Brian and his wife were permitting Graybridge Circle, they also purchased that property from the town. And through a joint venture with a guy named Tim Racer, they conveyed the property to Tim. Tim conveyed a right of way to them, all with the express intent of providing access to this back parcel, which is now the subject of the open space uh, development plan. Can you ex demonstrate yeah. where the right of way is that you're referring to? I'm not sure. I'm, I Kristen, I can, if you're, yeah, you're much closer, man. Yeah. And if you could also show what property was, you were talking about property that was purchased in 1991. Is it? Just can if you can just show on the map which properties you're talking about. Christine, you need the microphone, please. Yeah, you need the mic. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Uh, again, Christian Smith with Beals Associates. Um, so the the access easement runs basically right here, and I can actually color that up in blue if it may help you all. So it has 75 feet this along. Side of the room can't see. Pardon? This side of the room can't see what you're doing. Yeah, I will move once I okay, get done drawing. So that blue line represents the location of the uh, of the access easement over this parcel, and I believe that's the one in question that we're talking about from 1993, four, whatever it was. Um, what's the width? What's the width of that access easement? 75. 75. It's 75. Okay. Yeah. And then it just tapers off. Uh, to where the existing Woods Road comes into <coughs> Brian's home parcel at this point. This is the limit of the Brickyard parcel. This is Brian's home parcel. That's his house and driveway. And this is the Mendez Trust parcel. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, <coughs> So, in 2019, um, hopefully I didn't inadvertently shut this off. In 2019, the Grisettes uh, began to take action in a public uh, sense to develop this property in the way that they had set it up to be developed uh, since 1991. And that is a concept, again, as I've said, for a 16 unit, it's very conservative. Uh, it's very uh, sort of complementary of the surrounding area. It's a 16 unit open space, what is proposed to be a, a condominium association, a condominium development which is permitted in the zoning ordinance, in the uplands area adjacent to the Greybird Circle, which if you're looking at it, it's that bright green uh, area right in the center of, of, uh, of the plan. 
Um, the goal is, in addition to, to, to uh, those 16 units, is to convey more than 32 acres, essentially the entire, um, if on that map, the eastern part of that map, which is the Mendez Trust property, um, to the town itself, which the town has, uh, we have discussed with the town, which connects to other town-owned property on the other side of the railroad tracks, uh, which is inconsistent with, the, with the, <coughs> the vision for open space continuity and the connection of, of open space tracks. Um, if you count that property, the 10 acres which Brian is proposing pursuant to the development plan to keep as an open meadow, which will be really a buffer between Tamarind Lane and the proposed uh, uh, open space development, we're talking about 42 acres of the existing acreage on, that, on those two parcels, which is 54. So it's 60% of those two parcels that Brian and his wife are proposing to either conserve or convey directly to the town. And when you count the 9.3 acres that they previously conveyed to the town, it's significantly higher uh, than that. So the work to date has been significant. Um, Brian has attempted with his neighbors to engage a very transparent process. There have been several uh, neighborhood meetings and lots of sidebars as well. Um, we went to a design review before the planning board, which from our perspective was very good because the planning board had very little um, substantive comments to make towards us and was, uh, I think, very receptive of the basic concept, particularly the amount of space that we're proposing to conserve and convey to the town. There was also a preliminary review before the Conservation Commission and a site walk, which again, I think was very positive. Um, and then we really started talking with Doug. And the issue there, again, is the yield plan, and we'll get into it more. But I think at this juncture, to summarize, uh, it's not an, an overstatement to say that the, 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 the very conservative development plan that is before uh, the town now is really the product of 30 years' worth of deliberate steps to preserve and maintain development rights because the goal always was, from the beginning, that at some point uh, there would be an open space development on this parcel. And of course, uh, it is designed, I think, in a manner that is very consistent with the surrounding area. And as I'll talk about later, consistent with the master plan and consistent with the specific view that the town has for these two properties. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris. Mr. Passe? Yes, sir. You used the word conservative twice. In what dimension do you see this as a conservative proposal? Well, certainly we can, we, we will talk about it later, but there are approximately 23 acres of uplands on these two parcels, 23 acres. If you apply the, the density requirements on the MP side, which is 1,000, uh, excuse me, 5,000 um, square feet per unit, a multi-use, which is permitted by right on the MP side, would be significant. I mean, I think we, we did conceptuals where there were dozens and dozens of units that were possible on the MP side of these two parcels. And so when you, when you consider 23 acres of uplands across a tract that between the two are about 55 acres, and you apply the density provisions of the town zoning ordinance, which in the R1 is 40,000 square feet, you see that this is a very modest proposal compared to and juxtaposed to what could potentially be proposed for the same lot. And then when you consider all of the land that is proposed to be conserved and the 32 odd acres that's proposed to be conveyed to the town, this is just that. This is a conservative and a well-intentioned and reasonable approach by a developer who lives in the neighborhood. The 23 acres of upland, if you will, is the sole uh, amount of the total it's the combined. contiguous property that is buildable, if you will. Yes. Is that contiguous 23 acres, or is it bit no, here and a bit there? that's the combined over the course, and Jim can talk about it, but that's over the two tracks, the uplands that exist across the two tracks. Thank you. Can we pause for a second, actually? Barb, are we... I just noticed as I was looking over at Bar Bob that... TV broadcast is, it looks like the, oh, town, hall. That's the other town hall. I just want to make sure we're, we're be recording yes, we're right now. Right. Okay. We have three consecutive meetings going on tonight. Yeah, it's a busy time of year. Okay. I, did, I didn't want to get halfway through and realize that we didn't have a recording of this. Thanks. All right. Again, Christian Smith with Beals Associates. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Justin briefly touched on the process that we've been through uh, to get here. When Mr. Gersett first came into our office to start contemplating uh, conceptuals on this, excuse me, I'll get over to this side, um, one of the first things he wanted to look at was what Justin referenced, and that was a mixed-use 
uh, contemplating using the, uh, the right-of-way access that comes out onto Route 111 at this location. And again, uh, it would have been an extension off of uh, Collin Way to get a mixed use at this location. And that resulted in um, just about 67 units of combined residential and commercial space. Before you uh, go away there were large, uh, larger wetland crossings uh, required to get here, obviously bigger roads. That got scrapped fairly quickly. Oh, Can you losing. describe the nature of the Kingston Road right-of-way access? I don't, I'm not sure I understand what that is. That is, is an access that was left when this was sold off. Brian can, I'm certain, be much clearer on it. Uh, and what is the condominium name, Brian? Brickyard. The Brickyard Condominiums, the commercial condominiums. And uh, there is an access over this piece of land, which allows Brian to get out to the Mendez property, which they do own. Um, and that, that was the con one of the contemplations for so that. So it's actually constructed where the, the commercial condominium units are along, along to here, is that? Yeah, yeah. An extension, I'll, I'll of, an extension of the road that services the condominium units? That's correct. Okay. So that got quickly scrapped um, for a variety of reasons and then the contemplation became, you know, what about trying to get residential units in the NP zone? <clears throat> Line between the R1 is the heavy line here, which actually as well divides uh, the town of Exeter uh, open space, the rec park, uh, the Grisette parcel, and the Mendez parcel. Uh, so what we did is we took a look at, okay, well, lots in Exeter don't necessarily have to take a driveway through their frontage. Um, so we came up with this, and I guess the, you know, while it may not look conventional, so to speak, uh, it, it does comply with, with zoning, and we've actually reviewed this with uh, and all the tenants of the subdivision regulations. Of course, it never got designed because, again, this is something that Brian really didn't, uh, wasn't interested in doing, uh, but just to demonstrate the, the potential density, and we have reviewed this with, uh, with both Doug Eastman and Dave Sharples as well. Um, <clears throat> what we came to and the desired project is simply this. Uh, there would be the entire Mendez parcel plus about 4.96 acres of Brian's existing parcel that would be connected with that. Uh, there would be an open space component for the condominium development uh, and all of this would then be conveyed to the town for open space, provides connectivity to uh, not only the brickyard but other open space uh, further back in town. And I know Brian's gonna go over that in a bit. Uh, so what the proposal is, is for 16 individual uh, single-family condominium residences. Two to three bedroom, um, and then carving off Brian's uh, lot, a single additional single-family lot off the end of Cullen Way. Everything else would be protected. Um, I think that, uh, again, when you look at the wetland impacts that were proposed under the yield plan, it's just about... 6,000 square feet, slightly less than 6,000 square feet. And through this, we are actually under three. It becomes a, 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 min a minor, uh, excuse me, a minimal permit um, and one of the 30-day processes at the state. Under uh, three what? Uh, pardon me? Under, under three. three. Uh, uh, 3,000 square feet, I'm sorry. Just to get the driveway in. Okay. And you can see that we've done what we can to separate the driveway within that access easement from the existing driveway. Uh, there will be a small portion of paved area that will be taken out that is the beginning of, uh, of the Woods Road that enters this uh, piece of the property at this time. Um, I believe Justin mentioned we have been out here with the Conservation Commission. We've gone through a design review with the Planning Board uh, and we have gone as far as filing a site plan review application for this. We anticipate a TRC this coming Thursday, obviously dependent on, on how things go with, with this board tonight. Uh, the final piece that I'll touch on is uh, simply the, uh, the traffic element um, and the capacity of, of Tamarin Lane. Tamarin Lane is actually a 28 foot wide paved way, which is four feet wider than the standard road in town. Um, and we're proposing an additional 17 units uh, for a total of 51 uh, units that that road serves. Uh, again, it is, it is over-designed, it's got a wider right-of-way, 
And uh, the intention all along, and I believe why it got constructed to that level, was the future of, of development for this parcel. Uh, so it can, can certainly handle it and, um, you know, is obviously going to be in the background noise of, of traffic on Route 111. Uh, with that, unless Justin wants to follow up, I'll turn it over to Brian. Christian, a quick question, yep, if, absolutely. I, if I may. Mr. Smith, sorry, I shouldn't use your first Not name. At all. I don't know you well enough to do that. <laughs> There's 35 existing homes that are off of Tamarind Lane, and you're adding 16? Uh, 16 plus one well, on Tamarind, that's correct. Plus one on Colin at the end of Colin. You're adding Colin 17. Said. Thank you. Yep. Um, I, I have a, a question for you also. I don't know if it's, if it's properly directed to you. I, all of the property on that map except for the town the recreation fields is currently owned by is owned by the Grissettes. That's correct. Okay, and the remaining on this agreement, this previous agreement, where it refers to the remaining land, mm -hmm. does that encompass everything there? I believe so, but I, I will definitely let Brian answer that okay. question. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Brian Grissett. Um, in answer to your question, uh, yes, the original parcel, the, the remaining land, which mm -hmm. is uh, part of the uh, agreement that my wife and I uh, made with the town uh, back in 1991, which was actually an amendment to Charles Mutry's agreement from 84, um, consisted of Graybird Farm Circle, the, the land that we, uh, how would you say, ahead of time dedicated to the town for parks and open space, um, because Doug Dicey was very persuasive about a children's park at that time. Um, and the property coming back, it consisted of 40 acres. Um, the original parcel was 75. Um, when Tamron Lane was constructed and to the junction and to Cullen Way was built, uh, that was Mr. Mutry. There was a tie off to continue Cullen Way on. Uh, when Riverwoods came in, uh, I believe it was 93, 94, um, it was uh, blocked off as a dead end. Um, so there are 41 existing homes that utilize the Tamron Way entrance to Route 111. Um, so what we're looking at doing is adding from the 40 acres, um, what we retained was uh, a little over 22 uh, after we did the Graybird Farm subdivision, uh, the second phase of the project. Um, per the covenants and the dedication ahead of the 9.38. Uh, in 1993, when they're referencing the right of way, um, the town, uh, Peter Dow approached me um, because the Conservation uh, Commission was looking to sell this. The town took it by tax deed. They were looking to sell it in 1991 so they could acquire some open space property down on Linden Street where the bridge is on Exeter River, and they needed $40,000 to consume, uh, consummate that. Um, what happened was that they went to auction at the, I initially, um, after we had done this subdivision, um, we did not, from the beginning, the intent was to do this subdivision out of the 40 acres and retain um, 31 acres. Um, which was the goal because my wife is a city person. I'm from the Sierras in Alaska, and I like my space, so a compromise was we bought this property so we would both have, she had a neighborhood, I had a place to walk. Um, so that was the concept. When uh, we were approached, I told Peter no um, because we didn't want to have any issues with the neighbors disturb, uh, and upset them. Um, the auction took place, nobody showed up, um, and I was approached again. And based upon our agreement with the town and our uh, ultimate right to develop, I do environmental land consulting. Um, and one of the things I considered was that this is all wetlands that intersect the property. And this is Scammon Brook. And so one of the considerations was that by acquiring the property 
seeing that the soils were not um, accurate on the Rockingham County mapping at that time, um, that we could get the, the existing pond and the existing uh, access road. We could do a lot line adjustment of 9.1 acres, transfer it, and retain a right of way, which would have a lesser impact than trying to come across this whole wetlands. So we agreed with the town. It was with their blessing. Um, in fact, uh, our development, my development company at the time, Graver Development, was the developer, and the town was uh, still owner when we did the application for lot line adjustment. Um, so they were well aware of our plans, our discussions, and the end result was we joint ventured with our joint venture parser, uh, partner in uh, Graybird Farm Circle, and we acquired the property, received the lot line adjustment and the right of way. Um, and this was known to the eventual original purchasers, purchasers where we built this home, the Burnhams. Um, they were well aware of the development. And during that hearing, as we did two years prior in 91 in Graybird Farm Circle, we gave a warranty, a, mor a moratorium, of 15 years of any development of the remainder. Um, that was voluntary, because I like to walk around. Um, in 93, we extended that to 15 years at those uh, public hearings. But Mr. Burnham, when they decided to buy the house, um, they wished a 20-year moratorium. So we have a private agreement that was given to them that we would not do any future development or develop the right-of-way for 20 years, and that expired in 2013. But over the course of time, I have followed, as you're aware, I've been very involved in land planning and zoning, and uh, I have continued to track the changes of what was going on. Um, and so, based on the environmental planning, the open space development, um, if in the future, if, when it was developed, if it was developed or went to our children, um, it would be an open space development to preserve this meadow. Um, it is currently a wet meadow. Um, we have maintained it for the past 30 years. We reclaimed it. Uh, the prior developer had actually put in a clay pit uh, with a permission from the town. Um, when he went belly up, uh, the town didn't draw the bond, and so it had been left open and exposed and eroding. We reclaimed that in conjunction with the town. We also brought in some of the material for reclamation to assist them in a sewer separation project. So everything was... Everybody knew what was going on. Um, in 2003, um, we acquired the Mendez Trust uh, property. Um, there was an issue on the right of way, and what ended up happening, we came with a settlement with the Brickyard condominiums. We have now a deeded restricted access right of way, uh, which is specified, um, which extends basically there is, it's 835 feet from Kingston Road, crossing 150 foot wide wetlands area to come back to uh, the property one. Um, and of that 835 feet, approximately 525 feet are not de uh, developed at all. So in looking at, as um, Christian was saying, um, I had looked at different variations to do this. And I guess that I should know the you should know the motivation. Um, a year, a little over a year ago, in October, September and October, my wife um, had an incident, two incidents. Um, she had low vision at that time with retinitis pigmentosa. She was told that she would have visible sight for the remainder of her life. There were two incidents, 30 days apart. Um, she is now uh, legally blind with declining, and the motivation for me giving up my walking around is um, there is potential that will be, uh, there'll be stem cell uh, procedure that could restore her sight, and the cost is $850,000. So that is our motivation for moving forward. But anyway, the long and the short of it, in, in consideration, um, I have followed the master plan and the planning um, throughout this entire 30 years. Um, connectivity between has been an issue with the planning board in the master plan also. 
um, for the open spaces. It's now required under the ordinance to attempt to do connectivity. And so the options of looking at doing what's allowed, which would be uh, multi-use, which would require no special exception, multi-family use, which would be required the special exception by right, um, but we'd be looking for multifamily, and that would be 67 residential units that would be allowed by the formula. Um, but once again, we have all of the environmental factors involved, access, and so what, in looking at this, our stated goal um, of the maintaining the environmental aspects of the property, um, the wet meadow that we've maintained for deer habitat and for um, nesting birds, hawks. Um, we looked at doing an open space development with the, the, the merged lots. Um, we had an option of doing multifamily. Um, <clears throat> if we're doing residential and you have a lot that's over 20 acres by ordinance, you're required to do open space. This is 30.76, this is 23.6. So open space is the way to go without asking for an exception. So actually we're trying to comply with all the zoning. Um, and so we came up with this plan, which based on our yield plan, um, doing uh, our yield plan, what we were looking at with the special exception request later on, we were asking for the allowed residential use but to do R1, not two, four, or multifamily, which we could request, um, which have, others have done in the past, but to have the matching zoning of R1 for both. And based on that formula, we came up with a total of uh, 17 total homes, plus the uh, uh, donation, the, dens uh, the bonus for open space, doing more than 50% which we will exceed. And so we have a total of 19 units. Um, then based on the configuration of the wetlands that come across and surround, um, we're only gonna use uh, 18 out of the total yield instead of 19. 16 would be where it was originally intended. Um, we have the existing home and then there would be one single family lot, conventional lot here. The intention is to, uh, under the covenants, um, we as the prior, the developer successor can add additional uh, property to the subdivision um, at our discretion. And so we feel that putting these two as conventional lots, it will close off the neighborhood. Oh, no. Back to design intent, the idea is to preserve the integrity from the neighborhood so it is consistent. And then when the open space, there, this entire frontage along uh, Tamron Lane uh, is uh, forested. Then we go back, we're looking at uh, approximately 500 feet from the road and there is um, screening across the entire frontage of the property plus these additional blocks all across, so there is no impact, visual, noise, whatever, to the surrounding development. Um, what else? And the beauty is that I'm in discussions with the Conservation Commission and Kristen. Um, one of the reasons the HOA will be maintaining the open field is because as part of the covenants, they'll be required to do um, the annual mowing uh, in the fall to maintain the grassland habitat for the mammals and for the uh, birds. Um, and then we are anticipating that in the end, what will happen is the connection with Brickyard Park to the 9.38 plus the three that Bell and Flynn gave, the 12 acres, will now form the connectivity. We have an existing parking lot. There's an existing old farm road. So we'll be able to bring it back a trail system uh, so that everybody in town can utilize it. So, but that's basically the concept. Do you have any questions? Does, do these three parcels 
um, constitute all of your land holdings in the area? Correct. And this proposal will exhaust all of your development rights? Correct. Okay. Yeah, in fact, on the, the two uh, conventional lots will be deed restricted as stating that no further development can happen. So this is it. Okay. That's, that was my main question. I didn't really understand the last bit about the trail and um, the connectivity. Could you maybe just explain that? Again? Yes. Um, this is the ball fields. Mm -hmm. um, and Sorry, um, again, please, Mr. Grissett, where are the ball fields? The ball fields are on this. On that, the top part of that, right? Right here. Yep. So you have your ball fields, and... There's a little parking lot associated with them. Right. So, it, as you can see from the photo, the ball fields are here. Yep. Parking lot is on the Bell and Finn parcel, and you can see... From the aerial, there's this is the tree line that follows the existing farm road that originally came all the way across the property. And so what we're proposing is that, that a nature trail can be set up for the public access to the additional 32 acres. So you'll have a total of 46 acres um, for open public access. And you can make out in this section where the, you see the vertical lines. This is the wet meadow that's maintained, used to be an old hay pasture. And this is area is the HOA preserved um, open space. Okay, thank you. Good evening. My name is Jim Gove with Gove Environmental Services. Um, Brian's done a wonderful job of talking about this parcel, so I feel like all I just need to do is sort of hit the high points. Um, as you know, uh, Scammon Brook uh, passes through this parcel uh, going from west to east and uh, actually goes into the prime wetland, which is this dark brown area, and then continues on to Little River. So we have prime wetland on the site uh, that's actually the Mendez Trust. Uh, the Natural Heritage Bureau does not have any identified rare, threatened, or endangered species on this parcel. However, we did find uh, two active vernal pools during our investigations. They're located in the southern portion uh, of the parcel uh, and will be protected uh, by this proposal. Uh, we have done a wildlife study out there, and we noted uh, a number of uh, wildlife corridors, primarily going from east to west and a lesser amount uh, going to the north. Uh, to the south, uh, this is so developed down here that uh, you're not having any travel to the south, but you are having east to west, west to east, and then uh, north to south uh, above. Um, Shoreland Protection District has been identified out there for Scammon Brook. And uh, basically, this is a, a forest and scrub shrub area with the exception of the maintained uh, grassland, as uh, Brian mentioned. Um, just to talk a little bit about the benefits associated with clustering all of this uh, in this particular area. It uh, maintains the wildlife corridors. It will certainly prevent uh, any kind of uh, water quality degradation to Scammon Brook or on Little River. It conserves uh, a majority of the aquatic habitats uh, on this site and terrestrial habitats. Um, it also preserves and enhances the recreational aspect and the aesthetic aspects of this parcel and certainly encourages the kind of development uh, for the maximum protection of the wetland resources and upland areas uh, for this site. So I'll be glad to answer any questions or pass this back over to uh, the attorney. On the uh, chart, you have very close to the access road onto Tamarin Lane, a pond. Can you describe that? Yes, it's a man-constructed pond. 
Uh, that pond, I believe, I can't tell you for certain, I know it's man-constructed, I believe it was originally put in uh, as a, a, a mitigating measure for stormwater management. Uh, and uh, a, the actual uh, area of an existing path comes just to the south of the pond. And that would be the area which would be widening out in order to uh, get access to this area. So, um, and the only other feature I want to point out because it was mentioned by the Conservation Commission, we found a number of very large swamp white oaks uh, in this area in which I flagged up and the large swamp white oaks uh, will be uh, maintained. They will be avoided. Is the pond gonna be maintained? The pond will be maintained as is. Was, it, was there wetland impacts? I know he kind of went over it yes. quickly. Yeah. Yes. Um, in that area? Yes, the, this is the area of wetland impact. Okay. Uh, this is the only area of wetland impact. And it'll be about 2,500 square feet, uh, which makes it a minimum impact project. And is that filling in a piece of the pond or other wetland no. impacts? It, it, fill, it fills in just a slight portion of the pond, but it actually fills the majority of the forested area over here. Okay. And that would be subject to DEP approval? DES approval, correct. DES approval. Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, one more question, if you don't mind. You just said two vernal pools. Correct. Are they the two marked in the lower center portion? It they looks are. Like one is in one parcel and one is in another. Uh, yes, uh, though this here. portion of it's going to be uh, also protected as well. But uh, this one, uh, this vernal pool, uh, which we observed on the site walk, is actually uh, created. Uh, was dug out when somebody was trying to uh, get some sand out of it. So, uh, so this was dug out. This one uh, was is naturally occurring. They both are fairly productive. Um, one had 52 wood frog egg masses and the other had 40 wood frog egg masses. So that's a fairly productive vernal pools. Thank you. Yep. Um, so first, thank you for your uh, diligence and paying attention and following along. I know that's a lot of information. It's a lot of information that's uh, context. It's a lot of planning type information, but uh, we think it's important. Uh, I think the summary of what you just heard is that the proposal before you, which is really what we're going to turn to now in the context of Mr. Easton's decision, um, is not uh, about a yield plan that was uh, produced over the course of five minutes with Beals and Associates. This is a process that has taken decades to happen. It's after close monitoring of the changes to the local regulations. And it's pursuant to a true consideration of these properties and what's best for them and what's best for the Grisettes and also uh, mutually beneficial for the town as well. So I think that's a summary of what we've heard so far. I would like to narrow the scope a bit of, of what I hope to address uh, first, which is really the administrative decision. And that requires just a, a brief discussion of the open space planning process and the development of a yield plan itself. And for, uh, you know, I, I know it's, it's, it's a summary for the board, but for the members of the audience, the process of an open space development requires producing a yield plan. And a yield plan by definition is the depiction on a plan of conventional subdivision in the area and then those conventional lots are translated into units, which are then put in a cluster and enjoy dimensional benefits that they wouldn't otherwise uh, be able to enjoy. So again, you produce a plan that shows conventional lots that meet the subdivision requirements and the requirements of the zoning ordinance. Those lots are then translated to units depicted in, in what usually appears a cluster as you've seen today. And then that goes to the planning board. And the planning board, through their TRC and through their review process themselves, they have to accept the yield plan. So uh, we're here to discuss a, a, an issue sort of distinct from the process of producing a yield plan, and that is whether or not it is appropriate for the Grisettes to depict some of those conventional lots in the NP, which again is in that, on that plan is the eastern side of that, those two parcels, to, uh, to, to depict those 
residential lots, which are R1 density, much larger than 40,000 square feet, which is required um, for the purposes of a yield plan. And there are two regulations which inform the process. And the first is in the zoning ordinance, the second is in the subdivision and site review regulations. The first in the zoning ordinance is section 7.7.1, and it explains what a yield plan has to do. Pursuant to this provision, a yield plan has to depict density on parcels that is reasonably achievable under a conventional subdivision following the requirements of the zoning ordinance and subdivision and site review regulations of the town. So that's the first requirement that's in the zoning ordinance, section 7.7.1. Pardon this, me. Do you mind if I interrupt? Nope. Does reasonably achievable include an environmental assessment of the amount of the land that's actually visible, uh, buildable and whether there's access to it? Well, I think it goes to the heart of, of uh, the issue, but I think the planning board would definitely say yes. I mean, I think you'd look no further than the, the, with the, the Rose Farm situation where there was a bridge proposed to access some of the lots. The planning board looked at and said, yeah, you can draw that lot on the, on the plan if you want, but you're not actually ever going to develop it. And a lot of what this yield plan business is about is academic in nature, right? Because nobody's ever going to subdivide like that. It's just a depiction of what is reasonably achievable. So part of that analysis before the planning board is going to be, if we get there on this yield plan, whether or not the planning board thinks these lots are reasonable, reasonably achievable. It may be that after that review, the lots are reduced and they say you have to take one off or this isn't, a, this isn't possible and we'll take that issue up at the time when we get there. The question for this board is whether or not it's appropriate to depict residential lots on the MP, in the MP district without a variance. And so I just mentioned the first requirements in the zoning ordinance. Mm -hmm. The second and only other requirement that mentions uh, the requirements of a yield plan is in the subdivision and site review regs. It's section 7.13. It says, yield plans must comply with conventional subdivision regulations and shall not require a variance from existing zoning ordinances in order to achieve the layout supporting the proposed density. So to summarize the requirements of a yield plan in Exeter, it must be first, reasonably achievable, second, comply with the subdivision regulations, and third, it can't require a variance. Those are the requirements for a yield plan in Exeter. Our yield plan, as we have discussed already, uh, depicts 16 conventional lots um, of those lots depicted, all of them have R1 uh, density. Portions of six lots, which are on the subdivision, or excuse me, the yield plan that we provided to you, are in the NP zone. Our position is that because we meet the requirements of the zoning ordinance and the subdivision regulation, i.e., they are reasonably achievable, they comply with subdivision regulations, and they do not require variance, that all that is required is a special exception, and this is where it's nuanced and confusing but under the zoning ordinance in the NP district, again, where there are portions of six of the 16 lots that we depict on the yield plan, residential uses are permitted by special exception, special exception. Residential uses are defined as inclusive of single family, double family, multifamily. So it's all residential uses are permitted in the MP by special exception. So our position, once again, we meet the regulations requirements but regarding yield plans. I I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm confused. Isn't the issue the, isn't the issue the dimensional regulations? Yeah. I mean, I, that's where I, that's where I have a disconnect here. What I, what I understand, and I, I'm frankly a little confused by, by the request. Um, and I don't, I just, there's a lot here, so a lot of background. So, I mean, as I, I sort of, my simple mind, what I understand being requested is, you've created a yield plan that applies the dimensional regulations for the R2 zone across the entire property. Am I misunderstanding? Okay. We have created, again, where the prop, where the actual open space development will occur is R1. That's the, that's the western side of the plan. That's the Grisette property. For, that well, that's for the, for the open space subdivision, but the yes. yield plan. The yield plan depicts R1 conventional lots across the whole plan. R R1. R1. I'm sorry, I think I said R2, but yeah. what I meant was R1. Okay. So, and, and I'll, we'll discuss what Mr. Eastman's decision was. And, and of course, I meant to say that the, at, this out, at the upfront, this is complicated and nuanced, so none of this is meant as an approach to Mr. Eastman, who is always wonderful to work with and is uh, a great asset. But what, what we did in this, as we started to hear rumblings through the planning department and from the town that, hey, this is an issue, you might need variance relief, 
we compiled what you see in your package, which is a very extensive, comprehensive look at how these regulations have been interpreted in Exeter in the past and how and what they say and what they mean and what they should mean. And uh, Mr. Eastman looked at that and, and gratefully in a day responded. And his response was this, and I'm quoting, it is my opinion that the ability to transfer the density of residential units from the NP zoning district would first require obtaining a special exception from the ZBA to permit residential uses in the MP zone. So to that point, we agree. That's what the special exception is that's before the board tonight. He goes on to say, this relief alone would not allow for the ability to transfer the permitted residential density from the NP to the Grisette's property situated in the R1, low density residential district, but only permit the use. It is my opinion that additional relief from the ZBA by seeking a variance would be necessary for the requested transfer of density as described. So again, the issue is some of the six, six of the 16 lots on the yield plan, some of those, six of them are in the NP. And the issue is whether or not, even though there are one density and the, the, the site for the development is R1, the issue is whether or not we can use those lots which are in the NP for our yield plan to count as units in the end site, uh, site plan for the condominium uh, uh, site plan. Is that so, the question, or is the question whether you can apply the R1 density for those lots? The question is, as framed is by Mr. Whether Eastman, you can is use whether we can use the density that we're showing on the yield plan in the NP for the open space development. Without a special exception? No, no. with a special exception, without a variance. Our no. position is we need a special exception because we, we are. We're showing... Residential uses in the MP. The zoning ordinance says you can do that, you need a special exception. So that's what our special exception document is. But Mr. Eastman's position was because some of the, the lots are in the NP, I, I, and I'm not trying to speak for him, but, and I'll address the three arguments that we've heard from the town in this context, but I think the notion is that that is somehow tantamount to a transfer of development rights or a transfer of density, which is a term of art, which is an innovative land use control under RSA 675, uh, 6721, which the town has not adopted. So I think part of the perspective from the town is that's a transfer, and you can't do that because we haven't adopted that. I'll address that, but that's the issue. The issue is not that it's R1 density. It's, that's unrelated to the issue here. The issue is, can we have a yield plan that shows lots in the MP that are used to the ultimate end figure, the number of units that will be committed in the open space development. That's the issue. So I just want to ask you, if you did not use mm -hmm. that um, trust Mendez, because it's the it's that property that we're talking about, right? Correct. If you did not use that, how many units would you be able to put in your development? The I think the number is 13. Okay. And with that, it's... I think 19 because you had bonus because of, it increases the size of There is a bonus in play. There's also like a conventional okay. subdivision, which is a part of this. But the okay. yield plan mm -hmm. is 16. That's, that's the number that's, on the okay. yield plan. Right. So it's, it would be 13 if you didn't, and it's 16. Correct. Okay. Okay, so uh, Mr. Thielbar. You showed <clears throat> three houses coming in from the north in your plan. Um, did you, the current regulations require 100 feet of footage, front, frontage. Did you have the 100 feet for those three lots? I defer to, to Mr. Smith, but my understanding is that all of the lots on the yield plan comply across the board with the, the subdivision and site review regs and that that was vetted and confirmed by the town. Yes. Mr. Thielbar, as you can see, the, uh, the three coming in, I, I assume this is what we're talking about? Yeah. Uh, those two have 100 feet of frontage on Route 111, and the third actually has its frontage on the proposed cul-de-sac. But they indeed all do have the 100 feet of frontage. Can we split frontage like that? Yeah, there is, there is no regulation in the uh, subdivision rigs that requires you to take your driveway through your legal frontage. So in other words, there would be three driveways here, all, the, all that being subpar frontage for the middle lot. It has 
adequate frontage on the on the proposed cul de sac. Did you mean 150 feet of frontage? Because that's what the minimum is. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Are there any other questions about sort of the core issue? I, it is so nuanced, and I just want to be sure that we're on the same page before we go forward. Yeah, I think I'm beating a dead horse here, but I want to be absolutely sure that I'm clear. The, the yield plan applies R1 density and dimensional regulations for every lot shown on the yield plan. Yes. Okay. But the yield plan includes property from that that right hand portion. R1 plus NP. Plus NP. Right. Yes. Okay. So as, as a sort of, again, as an academic thing, I can understand <clears throat> the sensitivity here, right? Because the density in the NP is much higher than the density allowed in the R1. So that's the concern, that, that there, we may be taking a higher density and for the purposes of a yield plan and open space uh, development, plugging that into the R1 where it wasn't intended, okay? As I've said before, I'll reiterate it before we're done here tonight, that is not what we're doing. We are just depicting R1 density across the entire two tracks. Okay, so that's the, that's the foundational point. The, as I said, there are three basic arguments that we heard from the town in our discussions with them uh, regarding their concerns and the, and the basis for why a variance may be required in this case. And the first one is that the zoning ordinance doesn't contemplate a density transfer between zones and therefore uh, that's not permitted. You need a variance. So that's the first one. The second one is, uh, based on the precedent in two distinct cases in town, that uh, those of the 80 Epping Road case from 2014 and then the Felder Cool property case from 2007, um, that the, the, the precedence in town is that you need a variance in this type of situation. And then the third argument really is that our proposal is tantamount to a transfer of density or uh, development rights under 674.21, which is the Innovative Land Use Control Statute. The town has not adopted that because you're proposing that you need a variance. So those are the three basic arguments that we want to respond to right now. And the, that first argument is, again, the zoning ordinance doesn't contemplate this, uh, the, the density transfer between zones, and therefore uh, they're not permitted. And the, 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 my response to that is that is simply not the case. This is not tantamount to a persuasive ordinance argument where in a use context, the town says, look, you want to do this use, the zoning ordinance doesn't say you can do it, it's a permissive ordinance, therefore you can't do it, you need a variance. That is not the case here. In this case, as I've, I've explained already, the zoning ordinance and the subdivision regs contemplate the process to use when a, an open space development is proposed. It specifically contemplates using multiple tracks, and it says when the, the tracks of record are more than 20 acres, you need to do an open space uh, uh, development plan. So the internal safety net for the yield plan process, which I think the town is trying to convince, uh, protect against, is there, there is a safety valve in the regulations. The regulations say it has to be reasonably achievable, it has to comply with the subdivision regulations, and it can't require a variance. That is the safety check for the town to ensure that, yeah, we're depicting lots across two different zoning districts, but residential uses are permitted in both zoning districts, it's just that the NP requires a, a special exception. So there is a process in place in the town's regulations to address this exact situation. So I, I, we disagree that because it doesn't say you can do it, uh, then you can't do it. And as you'll see, if we unfortunately get to it in the variance context, when I asked the town, what is it that we need relief from? The answer was, well, it's not in the zoning ordinance, so you need a variance. So it's difficult to even say what we need variance relief from, um, because I think in general, the interpretation from the town historically has been, you can do precisely what we're proposing, which is a good segue into my next point. The town of Exeter has permitted exactly what we're proposing in the very recent past in the context of the Rose Farm um, subdivision. And for the town's benefit and for the board's benefit, I know many of you are familiar with it, but that is a 41 lot open space subdivision that consisted of four parcels of land across three individual zoning districts. The vast majority of the development on, in that uh, subdivision is on the R1 district, okay? But the other two parcels, uh, excuse me, the other three parcels across the R2 and R4 uh, were cited in, in zoning districts that had much higher uh, density. And as, as was approved by the planning board on the yield plan, 11 lots in higher density R2 and R4 were depicted 
on, on the yield plan, on the, on the overall site plan and subdivision approval, five of those lots had significantly lower density than what was allowed in the R1. And those lots ended up in the final uh, open space development plan. So in that case, which I'm not begrudging anyone, I think that's the correct read of the ordinance. I think the ordinance contemplating, contemplates doing exactly that because the idea is to create open and contiguous and environmentally uh, uh, conscious land. But in that case, there was, you're depicting lots of, of higher density in, in zones that allow it, and then you're taking those units and putting them into a, a zone R1 where the actual development is going to occur, which doesn't permit it. And the point is, there's no variance that's required in that context. And even though, go ahead, Mr. Bowman. I, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm getting a little confused here. Um, isn't that opposite of what you're saying here? I mean, as I understand it, what you're saying here is that you've applied R1 across. Which is why we don't think we need a variance. I guess what, what I'm having a little trouble with is understanding exactly what, I mean, because it's, it's, it's complicated, and yep. I want to make sure that if in the you know, consideration of administrative decision, I understand exactly what the, what's being asked, and I, I guess I'm still not exactly clear. Um, You've, you have far more articulately than me highlighted the nebulous nature of this request. We have a yield plan which by every, uh, from our perspective, from a plain language reading of the ordinance should be permitted. We are proposing to get a special exception for the residential uses depicted in the MP. We don't think we need a variance to transfer density from the NP to the R1. We're not transferring density. We have an open space. Well, plan. I guess, you know, I mean, it's your, as you know, it's your burden to, to show that the administrative decision was, you know, was incorrect. Sure. Um, I guess I'm, I, I, I'm still struggling with just exactly what, are you asking for a determination that the, um, that the yield plan could, could utilize or could depict lots in the NP because no variance is We're required? We're asking for a determination that we can proceed to the planning board with the yield plan that we have as long as we get a special exception. We have been told by the town that we need a variance. We're not sure what we need a variance from. We think the open space concept is consistent with what we're proposing. We're not transferring density. So the, the decision from Mr. <coughs> Eastman was we need a variance. We don't think we need a variance. We think the yield plan is consistent with the regulations. Now, the planning board is going to do what the planning board does with it. It's going to look at the reasonableness. It's going to look at the achievability of the proposed lots. But the mere fact that we have lots in the NP, put whatever density you want on it. The fact that we have density in the, R, in, in the MP depicted on our yield plan is why we're here. Because that answers my question. That Thank you. I mean, I think that's what your if the focus is. The fact that there are lots depicted in the NP, if that's the, you know, if that's the error, that's very helpful to understand. Yeah. Well, no, that's the whole, it's, I mean, we, I think we've outlined it at, at length in our filings. It is, there are residential lots depicted in the MP, and as we say throughout, and as I've said already, we think we need a special exception for that. We have filed that special exception request with you tonight. What we don't think we need is a variance just to have, to just to use that yield plan. Are you referencing the Rose Farm case? Because in that case, there were also lots depicted that were in different zones and no variance was required. Is that My why point you're... exactly, okay. Madam Chairman, uh, Chairwoman, is that in that case, there actually was on their yield plan higher density lots that were counted towards the end result. And in that case, it was and higher density. In that density. case, the town's interpretation was you don't need a variance for that. Okay. In fact, after extensive litigation, nobody has raised that point uh -huh. that you need a variance for that. Were not all of the zones to be considered in the Rose Farm development residential zones where there was not even a special exception required? That's true. It was R1, use. R1, R2, and R4. Whereas the density that you're taking advantage of here is in a zone that at least requires a special exception. Right. No, that's correct, Mr. Pryor, and that's why we have filed a special exception request. Yeah, we've, we've been on the same page with the town on that from the beginning. Our intention was, okay, here's our yield plan. Some lots are in the NP. We need a we need a special exception for that. So I do find your use of the Rose Farm, frankly, inaccurate in this case as, okay. an, as an example, because those were all in the residential. Those were all residential 
where residential usage granted different densities, different zones, but there was no special exception required. So, so it's really not relevant here or so, as relevant. So what you, what you did say, as I understood, that you took higher density in an area that wasn't used for the construction and transferred that higher density to where the work actually was done. The but in this case, you're saying that you're not doing that. The density is the same both in, in this... Density is actually it's less. less. But they're and using the, the zone. property in a different... They're using yeah. the lower density across the entire parcel, even though right. they're taking dense development rights from the NP zone where they could have higher density, right. I think. I higher think density, so but by special exception. And, and I actually have a problem with what they did in Rose. The, you shouldn't have been able to transfer the higher density into a low density area. But that's well, not what that's, they're doing. That's, yeah, we're not, not discussing yeah. that here. Well, but but just, I think it's there. a salient <laughs> point because it highlights the precise reason, which is Mr. Eastman's language, which talks about the transfer of density. His administrative decision is about the transfer of a density. And again, I'll just read it. It says, it is my opinion that additional relief from the ZBA by, uh, by seeking a variance would be necessary for the request to transfer density. So to, to your point, Mr. Pryor, th that perhaps the Rose Farm example is not uh, as germane, to the extent that the town has asserted an interest in these matters, it is about density. And in the Rose Farm matter, they specifically transferred higher density to, the R to a lower density zone. And all I'm saying is <coughs> that didn't require relief. In this case, when we are not even proposing to transfer higher density from a different zone, we are required to get a variance. And I think, I think that's relevant. That's, that's completely aside from the special exception. We need to get a special exception. That's what we're here to do. Um, so that was the first main argument, that, that it's not in the zoning ordinance, therefore you need a variance from it. Um, the second argument and the third, which are much shorter, I promise, the first is that, hey, there's precedent in town about how we handle these cases. The first case is the A.D. Epping Road case. It's DBA case 1486. It's from 2014. The first thing to point out about this is that it's not an open space development case. But in that case, it's a big parcel on Epping Road. The front of it's on the C2. The back of it's in the R4. They were proposing, they, they wanted 81 units on that property. And the front only yielded 28 units. And the back only yielded 63 units. And so they needed to transfer 18 units from the front where the high density was allowed to the back. And the town, in reviewing it, granted the variance that was requested. And, but Mr. Hashad himself opined, he said, I don't think you even need variance relief. So again, totally distinct with what we're talking about here, where we have an open space uh, development and this exact type of work, showing conventional subdivided lots and then using those lots in an open space is the whole point of, of the regulation in, 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 uh, in question. And then the Felder Cool property was also held out as a potential uh, case that was similar. And in that case, it's the meeting place, off, again, off of Aiding, uh, Epping Road. In that case, there was a lot line adjustment, which basically brought some of the C2 into the R4. And then they were confronted with this issue where the residential multifamily use is not allowed in the R4. So that was a straight use variance case, which, again, is totally in opposite to the case here, which is open space. So the last argument that I'll reference, and then I'll, I'll be quiet, I promise, uh, for now, is that potentially it, it, our proposal is somehow tantamount to, as I've said, a transfer of density or development rights under 674.21, okay? And again, I think that's just based in a misunderstanding of those words because they are terms of art. And we dug into the legislative history of the adoption of that, of that statute, 674.21, to figure out what it meant and really what that is is a planning tool it's a tool that's designed to facilitate the the uh, reinforcement of development and redevelopment that the town is in favor of and to protect property that is is intended to be conserved and the way you see it i pointed to the dover into uh the dover regulations but the way you see it is downtown district town wants to redevelop it but guy doesn't meet owner doesn't meet any of the dimensional requirements of the zoning ordinance 
Then there's a property on the other side of town that's unimproved and it's got a bunch of open space and the town really wants to protect that property. And the transfer of density and development rights is envisioned as allowing the guy who owns property in the area we want to conserve to sell his development rights to the guy who lives in downtown and wants to develop his property. It's a mean to encourage development where we want it and to discourage development where we don't want it while simultaneously giving the guy who owns property in the hinterlands an economical, uh, economic benefit to his property. And we've quoted at length the Ben Frost, uh, attorney Ben Frost's uh, testimony before the legislature when this provision was adopted. And he's saying exactly this. That is not the same as what is being proposed here. Open space development is another innovative land use control that the town has adopted. And as I've said, pursuant to that process, this is precisely the way that it's envisioned to work. So those are the three arguments that we heard from the town about why our proposal was not consistent with the, with the zoning uh, ordinance and why we needed a variance. And we've also you know, laid out our argument at length in our filings. We rest on that as well. But I'm happy to take questions. If, if, if there aren't any questions now, I will stop talking on the administrative appeal piece and uh, let the public hearing uh, proceed. <coughs> Anyone have any questions? Come with that. No? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak? Please come to the microphone when you speak so it will be on the record. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Jason Reimers. I'm with uh, the law firm of BCM Environmental and Land Law, and I represent the abutters Patrick and Ann Flaherty of 8 Tamarind Lane. We agree with Mr. Eastman's decision that the applicants require a special exception and a variance. The applicants need a variance from Article 7 of the zoning ordinance, which is the open space ordinance. Nothing in the zoning ordinance, specifically Article 7, allows density transfers between zones. <clears throat> the issue, as we see it, is whether a variance is needed for the yield plan to depict residential in the NP district. A single-family open space development is not permissible in the NP district, and this is plainly stated in Article 7.5.3 which says in its entirety, a single family open space development is permissible in the RU, R1, R2, R3, R4 districts. So in order for a yield plan for an open space development to show lots in the NP district, a variance is required from this very clear language. In Attorney Passe's October 28th 2019 letter to Mr. Eastman where he laid out a lot of his arguments. He seemed to argue that because the ultimate development would, the, the condominiums, would occur in the R1 district, then the NP district is not part of the open space development. But even if the condos themselves would be in, in the R1 district, the applicants are proposing to use density derived from the non-residential property in the NP district. And that's not what the zoning ordinance contemplates or its language <clears throat> um, allows. And the zoning ordinance does not ascribe any residential use 
or density to the parcel in the NP district because you need a special exception in the NP district. And getting a special exception merely allows the use. So in order to take that density on a yield plan and use it on the yield plan and then take it from the NP district where open space development is not allowed and to transfer it outside of that district uh, is beyond what the zoning ordinance contemplates and therefore uh, a variance is required. And the residential lots and the density in the NP district on the yield plan is a necessary part of the open space process. And that's why it needs a variance. In that same October 28th letter, Attorney Passe also argues that open space development is permitted in the NP district because the definition of residential use in the definition section at 2.2.70 is broad such that it includes open space development. But I disagree. The more specific, very clear language of 7.5.3 clearly prohibits open space development in the NP district. It's not allowed as of right. <clears throat> and because that section is a very specific section, and I'm talking about 7.5.3, because it's more specific, that is the controlling provision. Therefore, a variance is required because the yield plan proposes to use portions of lots in the NP district. In addition to Article 7.5.3, Article 7.7.1 provides that, quote, dwelling unit density shall be determined using a yield plan, and that yield plan is used to determine the density that is reasonable, reasonably achievable under conventional subdivision. And this Article 7.7.1 again, directly ties the yield plan and the density derived from it to the open space development process. So the yield plan is an integral part of an open space development. And because this section or any other section of Article 7 does not allow the transfer of density, these sections require a variance if the yield plan is going to show residential in the NP district and if it's going to transfer density from that land. <clears throat> The applicants going to uh, the Rose Farm not being required to obtain a variance. I don't know what the reasoning was of the town, if it was considered at the time. Um, as it's been pointed out, the Rose Farm uh, proposal had property in three zoning districts, but they were all residential, which I think is a big difference here. But even if even if that was overlooked in the Rose Farm process and you think that either the zoning ordinance requires a variance or the applicant hasn't uh, met their burden, it doesn't really matter what happened in the Rose Farm case. You need to decide based on <coughs> the language of the variance and with regard to this particular plan. <coughs> so in closing, um, Mr. Eastman was correct and a variance is required as well as a special exception. Happy to take any questions. So you s said that a variance is required from Article 7? Correct, and which is, is one of the sections in their application as well. Yes, and is there a particular subdivision? Yeah, I think... <clears throat> you mentioned 7.5.3. 7 7 that okay. out specific areas that you're allowed to do the kind of mm -hmm. and I think what he's suggesting since it, w when you convert the uh, NP to an R it's still not one of those four that's listed I think well, you're, you're saying right. you at this stage we shouldn't be deliberating. Use. We should be addressing questions yeah. to that, the. That's what you're that, saying it, it, you no, can I'm get a special sure exception we for use. What he said. But yeah, yeah. I think you said that that it, it, you can get a special exception because the open space development is not permitted in the NP, right? But well, you need a special exception. But that doesn't because, address density. Is that well, what you, you need a, they need a special exception because residential is a use in the table of uses. Right, in the that right, requires right. Yes. A, a special exception. Right. And I'm saying you need a variance <coughs> because under this provision, yeah. it, uh, an open space development is not allowed okay. in the NP district. 
And then the yield plan, that's part of the open space development. So you can't divorce the yield plan from um, you know, the end result being the condos. Okay. So the applicant is making the case that the open space development is taking place in an R district. Correct. Your That's point is that the yield plan is not separable from the development is the point that you're making. Precisely. And therefore you should abide by the same 7.5.3. Correct. And then I pointed out that 7.7.1 it specifically talks about the yield plan, which is further support that the yield plan is an integral part of the open space development. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Would anyone else from the public like to make a comment? offer a brief rebuttal here. Uh, the, I'd, I'd first note that when specifically asked which provision we need relief from, Mr. Eastman did not posit that we needed relief from 7.5.3. The second point I'd make is that the position that you just heard is dependent on the one hand on a very technical and narrow view of the zoning ordinance. On the other hand, on ignoring language which is not present in the zoning ordinance. So the opinion you just heard suggested that because single family open space development is permissible in the R districts pursuant to 7.5.3, that the corresponding yield plan must also only be confined to the R districts. If that's what was intended by the language and the drafters of this ordinance and the legislative body, <coughs> that's what it would have been appeared in, in the regulation itself. It would have said single family open space developments and their corresponding yield plans are only permissible in the RU, R1, R2, and R3 districts. The much more logical review of this, especially in consideration in the way that zoning ordinances are amended over time, is that you look at the definition of residential uses in the definition section that says it pertains to single family residence, duplexes, multifamily, it's all residential uses, and that for the purposes of this ordinance in looking at this language, our open space development is in the R1. It is not in the NP. The NP will be unimproved open space for the benefit of the town for age memorial. I mean, that's that's the point. Can I ask? Oh, sorry. Well, where you propose to build is now zoned as what? R1. The entirety of the proposed open space development is in the R1. The whole point of the of the yield plan is to look at the parcels in question to look at what conventional subdivision could happen on those parcels, and then to use that density, which is why I think the town and the Rose Farm matter said, yeah, it's higher density in the R2, it's higher density in the R4, but that's all going to be unimproved, and the development's going to happen in the R1, R1 and that's so, fine. So what part of your density calculation comes from what is now... The NP. NP. What part? Portions of six lots. It would yield 13 units instead of 16 if they didn't, is that correct? If you didn't calculate that NP portion. Okay. Is but that I, what you're- That's where yeah. I'm headed. Is that an approximate or is that an exact? The six or the 13? The 13, the 13. Opposed, as opposed to 16. Is that approximate? Like if you didn't use the- we'll get, Actually, we'll get to that. Okay. We'll get okay. to that. We'll get to that if we get to that. Okay, that's separate separate issue. I do have um, a question for you, and this is just in, in looking at this and thinking about um, this 7.5.3 and the requirement of a yield plan. Doesn't that need to be to show what is reasonably, reasonably achievable without a variance? Isn't that part? Yes. Of, right. So if we... If it is true that you need a variance, does that mean that such a yield plan is not permitted? Or, because that would then eliminate any open space development of this type. My thought yeah. is... Let's, let's not yes. deliberate. So what do you have, I don't, I, well, I, I know exactly. I know this you wasn't know brought up in, in 
Doug Eastman's letter to you, and I don't know how much time you've had to think about it, but. Well, you, like so many of the questions from the board tonight, you're hitting on the circular nature and the problem with this argument, because that's the problem you run into. Okay, you need to get a variance. Well, now you have a variance. So is your is, so is means your yield the, plan yeah, acceptable it would now? That's the result it would give if right. that reasoning were correct. And the, 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 okay. the point is what we're proposing doesn't require mm -hmm. a variance. It requires a special exception, which is why we've applied for a special exception. Okay. And that's consistent with the town's interpretation of this exact issue. The other point, it's minor, but I mean, we've met, referenced it too. I mean, variance relief is intended to be a safety valve, a constitutional safety valve to, pre to prevent a taking. I mean, it is found, it's foundational. It is to prevent a taking from the government. And where it is our position that it is not appropriate in situations with the circumstances such as these to simply refer somebody to a variance because it is a high standard. And that's part of the argument that we're making. When the town has applied its own in regulations in this manner, where the circumstances and the scope and the context of the regulations and what we're proposing makes sense, is in keeping with the plain, rational interpretation of the zoning ordinance, an applicant should not be made to, to, to go get a variance, which exposes it to a lot of uh, liability and risk. Um, oh, I have sorry. one other question for you, sorry. Yes, in I'm any, sorry. I know we went through, you, you cited several examples of previous decisions. In any of those, was there a yield plan that was based on property in different um, districts that were non-residential, that were not our, the residential districts? The, so no, I mean, okay. it, they, were, they weren't open space developments. Okay. And I think that's part of the problem. There's not a ton of open space development. There aren't huge swaths of mm -hmm. undeveloped land in, in Exeter. So when this comes up, it's relatively, uh, you know, it's, it's, okay. it's not all the time. Okay. And I think that's the issue. I think that's why some of these inopposite <coughs> examples were, were perhaps pointed to by the town, which is understandable. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak? Okay. Uh, does anyone have any other questions for anyone right now? Someone oh. to speak. And can you just state your name, please? Good evening. My name is Anne Moran. I'm a longtime resident of Tamarin Lane, and I've been a, a, neighbor, a neighbor of uh, Brian for many years. Um, and I think that um, he has the right to responsibly develop his land. But I do have some concerns um, about the density of, uh, of the project. Uh, most of the property on Tamarin Lane and Cullen Way are one acre lots and I'm not sure of the exact acreage proposed but it seems tight for 16 to 17 individual condos. Um, Tamron Lane has a lot of families, young families, kids riding bikes, scooters and so there is concern about the amount of traffic that that would lead to on the property um, or in the neighborhood. Listening to the discussion about the zoning and the transfer of, of um, densities, I don't know anything about zoning really, but it just seems crazy that you can, it seems to me that you can manipulate anything to make, to do what you want with it. So, um, but again, I'm not familiar with how these things work. Um, but that was basically, I just wanted to, you know, my concern is mainly with the number of, uh, of uh, condos planned for the project and how that would affect the traffic in the neighborhood. And um, so, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Is there anyone else? Yes. Uh, I'm also an Anne, I'm Anne Flaherty. Um, so I just wanna make sure that I'm understanding this correctly because 
Um, even if the, the special exception and or variance, depending on what was needed, aren't granted, there would still be development rights. There would still be the potential for the, again, depending on what happens with the planning board, 13 and then potential other things, correct? Well, that would depend on what the applicant right. chose to but, do. But, this, but if there was no... This isn't, this decision here isn't preventing development. It's not correct. preventing so, development so. altogether, okay. no. Thank you. I no. just wanted to clarify just that. relates I, to the I particular the proposal. I that this would be like kill everything, but I don't no. believe that that's no. the case. No. Thank no. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Yes. Uh, my name is Trevor Knott. I live on Terman Lane, 15 Terman Lane. Um, I have a couple different things I wanted to talk briefly about. May um, I interrupt you for just a second? I want to point out that all we're considering right now is the appeal for an administrative decision. And if you'd like to, if are you addressing that the way in which we proceed, or is it a, a, a different sort of issue? So I think as with a lot of people in the room tonight, everyone, including the members of the board, seem a little bit confused <laughs> on exactly what's being voted on as Kevin Good point. Earlier. Go okay. proceed. Yeah. So I yeah. felt as though if I didn't voice my concern now, it may not have an opportunity to be voiced because I'm not exactly sure what this vote would allow or not allow, as Anne had mentioned. Okay, okay. fair enough. Um, with that being said, I'll try to make it quick. Um, appraisals, appeals, and applications for variances, special exceptions are being submitted to the zoning board for approval based on what I would consider layouts and designs, which assume that Mr. Gersett has the authority to construct a road through a private right of way. And uh, this is currently a, a neighbor of mine's driveway. Um, with that being said, uh, I would ask that the zoning board does not make any decisions until this discrepancy has been resolved. Well, I'm sorry, what's the discrepancy again? You said it was a right of way that goes through the yeah, driveway. So currently the, um, the final layout plan has mm -hmm. a road going through uh, somebody's property. Okay. So you're saying that that right of way is in doubt? I'm not sure of the existing, I'm not sure of the semantics regarding the right of way, but if you look at the plan, there's a road that just a dead ends in, in the neighbor's front yard. So the, the 75 foot right of way is on the property of 8 Tamarin Lane, which is my um, my property. And, and there is there is a right of way in the deed. Okay. okay, that's probably something that we should address again if we get, once we get right. past this matter regarding the appeal of the administrative decision. So okay, we may so if revisit that's something that. That would come up again yeah. later, then I don't need yes. to talk about that right now. Um, so, in that regard, you could tell me uh, right now if I need to discuss this or not. Um, the uh, Town of Exeter's master plan specifically states developing this land off of Kingston Road. Um, the proposed development has. Um, the access to this property off of Tamarind Lane. Um, Mr. Gersett, in my opinion, has forfeited his access to Kingston Road through the donation of free space to the town, Brickyard Park, and the development of Greybird. Um, subsequently, requiring access to a non-conforming community by zoning regulations in place during the original conception of the agreement, um, which is exhibit three, which was submitted to the board. Um, this proposed development does not meet the standards set through the governing covenants and should not be granted access through the development to be an extension of Tamron Lane. And that's all I have for now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. Jonathan Elliott, 6 Tamron Lane. I'll be brief. Uh, yield plan, again, reasonably achievable in a conventional subdivision uh, following town zoning ordinances. This is nuanced. I think the fact that you all are flipping through the town zoning ordinance is proof of that. 
um, I would ask that um, you uphold Mr. Eastman's decision and deny uh, this appeal. And uh, one more I'd say I'd point out that the special exception is for uh, permitted use only um, and not transfer of um, density. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> is there any, anything else? Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Then, does anyone else have any questions for the? Mr. Passe, do you wish to say anything else, or are you all set? I would. I would th there's very plausible and rational explanations to the objections that you just heard to, which we're happy to talk about with the abutters. They're also totally irrelevant to the proceedings tonight, and it will be taken up, I think, in the planning board context. Um, but to suffice it to say, over 30 years. This issue was contemplated. Steps were taken to ensure that rights were preserved and maintained. We're happy to explain that. We're happy to talk to abutters about uh, concessions, compromises, all of those things. I think that's probably better situated at, at a planning board level. The scope of the review here tonight is the yield plan and, and the arguments we've already made. Okay, actually, that, that does re just remind me of one other point I wanted to make sure I'm clear on. This agreement from 1991, the town agreement with the town, did that refer to, at that point, I don't think that the Grissettes owned that trust property, Correct. Mendez. So it didn't refer to that property. <clears throat> it referred to using density from the other pieces. It's is the that original right? tract they bought in 1991, okay. which is their 23.4, the Graybird Circle area, okay. and then the town property is about 40 acres. Okay, and do you know off, well, I guess we do know because that trust portion accounts for approximately three units with respect to density. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Close okay, Mr. Session, Grissett, please. are you all set? Is it um, appropriate for us to hear from Doug, Doug about... I was wondering about that. About yes, Doug, the, would you like to... Or do you have anything to say about yeah. the rationale for your decision? No, it's right off track. It's all... Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, we'll close public session then and begin deliberations. Okay. It is complicated. It is unclear. My inclination is given the, the lack of clarity surrounding this issue, the safest thing for us to do is to proceed uh, in a reasonable, safe way, mm -hmm. which would be uh, denying the appeal from an administrative decision and moving on to the underlying issue, which would be the uh, the variance or the special exception for uh, for the for the yield plan. It is unclear. I mean, seven point five point three clearly does not the, the language does not anticipate uh, the transfer of density amongst zones. Um, well, I guess I still don't. I'm I'm still struggling with that. I mean, I think. I'm trying to, that's why I was trying to parse out the specific mm. questions. And I think if, if question one is, can a yield plan include, um, you know, can it include the NP zone? And I, you know, I think that's, that's the first question. And to me, I, you know, I, I think that's fairly clear looking at the site plan re regulations, which say the yield plan shall comply with conventional subdivision regulations and shall not require a variance from zoning ordinances, existing zoning ordinances. So your answer would be no. Well, I no. I think my answer oh, would be yes. If, if only a special exception is required, right? Then I think the yield plan can include lots in the NP zone okay. because that a variance cool. isn't required. Okay. If a variance, if the NP zone didn't allow, I see residential yeah. except by variance, then no. That's a problem. But because. It, because the site plan regulations say variance. Where is the, what's the citation? That's in 7.13. 7. 7. Okay. In the site plan regulations. And it's um, not here. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that, showing it on the yield plan, I, that's more straightforward. What I think is less clear is what density gets applied for those. Can you apply the dimensional density regulations for R1, or would you have to, Apply well, the, NP. Well, they're not. NP do, is they're more not liberal. NP is more liberal, right? Except for setbacks, but that doesn't really come into play here. 
and it but, is. But and all, I, I think what the variance part of that question is is that all the lots on the yield plan are conforming lots. They're, none of them require a variance. Right. And right. that's where the variance comes in. So to conflate it with the fact that you need a variance just to be in the NP zone, to me, I don't think that was the intent. Well, and again, I don't. You don't need a variance to have residential use right. in the NP zone. So um, I tend to agree with you that I think it is. It makes sense to me that it is. It's not that it is allowed. Um, that it, I think it. It's not specifically prohibited. And it seems to me that it should be allowed, and it is not. In these circumstances, I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be. It's not like they're transferring greater density. And. Frankly, the land will not be, it's not accessible, <coughs> you know, to the end, to the access through the NP zone. There's no access available to it because of wetlands. And it seems pretty reasonable to use it in this way. Speaking of reasonable, the three legs were reasonably achievable, meets the subdivision regulations, and no variance required. We seem to be focusing on no variance required. Do you feel that it is that the site plan is reasonably achievable? Well, I want to be careful with that because that is, in my mind, a planning board determination. Because I, I don't know that we can answer. I don't think we can answer. I don't that. think we are in the yeah position to answer that. We haven't analyzed this from that point of view of all the things the planning board would look at. But then and they and will look at. I mean, that's the one thing I you know, and, and I I would like to be clear. Whatever decisions made tonight at least in, in my mind, would not prevent the planning board from oh, uh, from reviewing that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, Can you read that again, the seven point? Yeah, it is. Um, what page are you on? It's, the, it's, it's in the site plan, plan regulations. Oh, oh, it's not open. I was looking yeah. at open space. The yield plan shall comply with conventional subdivision regulations and shall not require a variance from existing zoning ordinances in order to achieve the layout supporting the proposed density. In order to achieve the layout supporting now, I think, the proposed density. And it's probably worth looking at the zoning ordinance as well. I don't think that's any more restrictive. Under open space development? Under, yeah. The yield plan is used to determine the density that is reasonably achievable under a conventional subdivision following the requirements of the zoning ordinance zoning and subdivision plan. and site plan review regulations. Thank you. I appreciate that. What's that site? That's in, now I'm going, now I'm reading in the zoning ordinance, 7. which is 7.7.1. 7. 7. 7. 1. 1. Yeah. So you have to follow the requirements of the zoning ordinance. And again, I would say that in my mind, that would include a special exception yeah. because a special exception is, you know, unlike a variance, is, is if you meet the criteria, you have the right mm -hmm. with a special exception. But they still need a special exception. They, yeah, no question. Yeah, they need no that. question. Absolutely. It just seems reasonable in my mind to, to that the yield plan could include if you if you could do a conventional subdivision on the lots where they've you know shown it on the yield plan, then I think that's what the yield plan asks. And then you get to Take what you could do. I mean, again, the idea behind the yield plan is you take what you could possibly do, but recombine it in a way that it makes more sense and, and, and preserves more open space. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and the only place where, where I would have trouble is if the, there was a difference in a, allowed density in the... In the Right. Lots involved, and we don't have that issue here. So, if they were trying to transfer, well, we make do, it but they're, they're choosing the lower, not the higher. Right. If they were choosing the higher, that would be different. But they're not; they're choosing the lower. Okay. They're applying R one to NP instead of NP to R one. Well, NP doesn't have a density, or, or does it? Uh, Resident. It does. It, it does. It does. It does. It's, it's mentioned. Higher. Okay. So maybe that's the circumstance where the yield plan can't require a variance. It's not 
can't use a yield plan that requires a variance. So that might restrict development if you are trying to transfer higher density. <coughs> You know, if we're trying to look at these to see how the regulations right. make sense. Right, but neither of those is really the higher versus lower, lower versus higher isn't really relevant here. No, it, it's not. Right. It doesn't. What we're saying, I mean, it's nice that they're using the R1, but the question right. is, can they use anything? Well, and I think it says 7.5.3 does not specifically mention NP. Uh, it says open space development. And attorney, was it Reimers or Reimers, made mm -hmm. the case that by being part of uh, the overall open space development article seven, that by not mentioning NP in 7.5.3, but only mentioning residential zones where residential uses are not even required, require a special exception, mm -hmm. that a variant, that in fact, we, Doug was correct in his uh, uh, administrative decision. Well, because it, it, you, I, yeah. I, I, would, I would say that if they were going to build or try to build <coughs> on the NP. Right. I know, this is the word in there, isn't it? The, then Is permissible in. in. If they were trying to build in the NP, that even with a special exception, they couldn't. But the point was, you're bundling up the entire open space development regulation and saying, 7.5.3, you don't, we don't get to weigh is 7.5.3 more important than 7.7.1. I mean, I think the difference is that, well, I, if the question is whether you can apply the yield plan, I think that's, the yield plan is by definition a conventional, applying a conventional subdivision, not an open space subdivision. Right. But it actually begs the question, which I hadn't thought of, which is, um, you know, how do you, do, what's, an, what's an open space subdivision? <laughs> Uh, you know, does that just include, right. does that the just include buildings. the buildings or yeah. does it include the buildings and the open space, which in this case is, is partially in the... Well, is the open in, space in the NP? Because that's going to be transferred to... Yeah, I, I, that's a good question. That'll go to Actually, the town. It's in the NP yeah. for purposes of, it's in the yield plan. Right. It won't be under the, in the, at the end of the development, it will right. be transferred. Right. The only thing that will be left is the is the actual developed parcel plus the adjoining the, the and the open area. space yeah. the open space yeah. the so it's not part of the rounds. yeah but it is certainly part of the yield, the yield plan. plan but the yield plan That's is by right. definition a, a conventional subdivision plan so right that's why I think it's so you're not violating by by using the yield plan you're not violating seven seven what do I have? Five three. Five three. Yeah. <coughs> right. I'm on the wrong one, but yeah, seven point five point three. So your inclination is to grant the appeal from the administrative decision? No, 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 no. Is it? I'm, no, I'm asking Mr. Baum. There's a two. Does this request only deal with uh, whether you can transfer? Without the variance. Without a variance? Or is it both the issues? Because. Both what issues? Well, the, the need for a. Um, special exception. Special I don't exception. think so. Well, not exception is I don't think they're appealing that. Regardless. It's we have just the yeah. variance that. Yeah, the special is. exception yeah. is separate. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Special exception we have to get to. So if we, if we accepted. Uh, their request for this item, we wouldn't have to deal with the request for a variance, but we would need to deal with a request for a special exception. Right. Yes. I think if there were a variance that were required, it would likely be from this 7.5.3, because we would be considering the, this open space development to be occurring partially in an NP zone. Is that, if we were to... The yield plan. Yeah. That's correct. The yield plan. Well, in order for it to require a variance from 7.5.3, the yield plan has to, it has to end up being part of the open space. 7.5.3 
addresses would, open space development. So we would be saying that the yield, whatever is on the yield plan we, is part of the open space development. Right? Well, we can the change density it. density is calculated we, based on it, but the actual fee ownership is going to be transferred to the town. Right. That's, I'm just, it so was, I'm trying to be, sort out whether this is consistent. It'll be an R with a special exception. Mm -hmm. The problem is it isn't one of the listed R's. The Not special sure exception followed. makes it an R. Well, if they need a special exception in order to include it on the yield plan. The special exception is because a residential use is permitted by special exception in the NP zone. Correct. It's not because you need to have a special exception to include it in the yield plan. Right. It's not specific to the yield plan. It's specific to a residential use in NP. Because what but you But it is a permitted use by, um, by special exception. So the language here almost sounds like permitted by right versus permitted well, by special exception. Well, I, I mean, I, I think it could be that it's permitted by special exception, but what I'm thinking is if you need a special exception to have the permitted use in this NP zone that's being used only for the yield plan, why wouldn't you then need a variance for, for the... De for the de the dense, because you're using that to calculate density for the open space plan. I mean, in neither scenario are you actually building on the NP property, but it's being counted as part of the open space development. I, I you know, to me, in one, to me, if they're not actually building in the old NP mm -hmm. zone, 7.5.3 doesn't apply. Doesn't apply. We need to move to a vote. To, can we to entertain a motion, or do we want to continue to deliberate? Uh, what do, What do we think? Is anyone prepared to make a motion? I'm not quite sure yet. Well, if we if we reject it, we're just going to have the same discussion yeah. in ten minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean. <laughs> I mean, I could make a motion. My concern in making a motion is I'm still... The scope of of what's being asked is, is still not completely clear to me. But let's go to... Um, you know, it's, the, it's on the applicant. Um, mm -hmm. So the decision of the enforcement officer to be reviewed. This is page two of the application. Mr. Eastman's decision that single-family open space development located in the R1 zoning district cannot utilize density from unimproved contiguous property in the neighborhood professional NP district, even where residential uses are permitted by special exception in the NP district, and even where such a special exception is obtained without also seeking, obtaining zoning relief. Okay, and my feeling is that as long as they had the special exception, they can use it and transfer it. Well, my question is still what, and I know we've had this, we're looking at 7.5.3, but what is the variance relief? It's, it's relief from what exactly? Do we, do we really know? No, that's, that's, that's the, the issue. issue. Because 7.5.3 is whether it's permissible which is more akin to the special exception that we've been talking about, isn't it? No, 7.5.3 is whether it's permit, open space is permissible at all. Right. And, I, and it's not permissible in the But MP. you can get a special The ex question there is, no, it's not whether you get a, you can't get a special exception. Mm -hmm. the, the issue is whether the, at the end of the day, we believe that there it's is an open space there. subdivision in the NP where all of the development and all of the property that's being retained as open space and as residential as the condominium is with is R1. in the R1. Or three or four. I mean there were Right, right, right. Yeah. Right. 
because it will be in there before it's conveyed. Just right. in, just in yeah. there. I, yeah, if I knew what, if we were more clear what the relief I don't know why they, from. why they felt inspired to limit where you could build it. <clears throat> there must have been some sort of <clears throat> process involved. Mr. Baum, what is your react? What what is the motion that you would make? <laughs> the hard part. Um, well, you could you could have the answer be yes or no. <laughs> I'm not trying to make this personal on you or on Mr. Eastman, but the the, the, the issue is, do we? Uh, reinforce the decision that a single-family open space development, et cetera, cannot, or do we overturn the decision? And as you say, the burden of overturning is on the applicant, and I'm not sure that it's clear. Many things are not clear. Mm. But I don't believe that they've made a, a, a clear case that the decision was wrong. I think that's why I said earlier, I think there's enough ambiguity surrounding this so that we should sustain Mr. Eastman's decision and move on to a discussion of the underlying factors. I, I agree because when we have something like this, we shouldn't put our, our staff at, at the, to making a decision that then can be turned around and criticized. Well, I mean, so any, we, anyone can make an inaccurate decision. I don't think that, I think in this case, I don't believe it was an inaccurate decision. I believe it was a decision made in the face of uh, a very complex uh, situation and, and, uh, and without clear guidance from the zoning regulations. Right. And, and with the ambiguity, he made the right decision to, to bring it to us. Correct. So we should support that decision and then go on and deal with it in the next step. Well, I think we're going to run into the same issue in the next step, which is the lack of clarity on the request. I mean, I... I but, it gets to, but this it is strictly right now an appeal. And not Doug's decision. This is strictly right now an appeal, right? Yes. And I don't believe that the, that the applicant has, has proven that the uh, uh, decision was incorrect. Right. I feel persuaded that that it's acceptable to definitely need a special exception, but that a variance isn't required in this situation. But I'm not a lawyer. Yeah, I think the question <laughs> is: did, did was a variance required to apply to utilize the NP portion of the subject property? for the yield plan determination. I mean, think about when you're doing subdivision. I mean, I know open concept subdivisions are separate or open space, but when you're doing subdivision, if, if a property <coughs> crosses a, a zoning line where the improvement is located, you apply the lot dimensional requirements to that to that zone, and if they need to use a little bit of the next zone to meet them, we, that's never been, as far as I can tell, an issue, right? I mean, like say something's in a residential zone, but they go into the hospital district or the industrial district a little bit at the back of the lot to meet. You mean where, to, where things are, where there's no development occurring? Is that what you're, or? So just a, developing a, a lot, say a, a house lot in, a permitted use in the zone and you to you to meet the, the minimum lot requirement you needed to go into the next and the lot ran into the next zoning district would that be a problem we I think that's been but is that just one house or is that an open space well I'm, I'm saying it's they're, a they're different, just, different things a single it is house a different and thing, but completely it, different it is the situation that we have an example a regular example of that that meeting dimensional requirements if if the lot runs into another zone we, that's that's something that's done all the time i just think of the scale of it is what the issue is 
Yeah, if I have my house and it goes another zone, okay, we'll give you a little, it's your one little spot, not... But it's the example five, that we have. Yeah, and... I'm I'm it's not perfect example, yeah. but it is the example we have. I don't know. I think I need to speak on that. Oh, you do? Yes, I do. Well, tell me what you think. Well, hang on. Do you, do you need to be up there? Yeah. I'm yeah. sorry, Doug. <laughs> he has a microphone over there at his I mean, desk, it's, right? It's okay for yeah. the speakers. It's okay. Yeah. I, I think it's okay. Yeah, Doug, would you? Yeah. So you ha you're saying that you have a zone, a um, piece of property in a zone, and... Uh, residential zone and part of that goes into a commercial zone that you can part take of the back. lot yeah no, I don't believe that for a minute you don't what I don't believe that for a minute you wouldn't consider that No, I would not it'd be before you guys again oh would it? okay <laughs> <laughs> I just I just had to make that point thank okay you. thank oh. you interesting that is interesting I did was it my impression that that's what happens but I am corrected. That's my opinion. <coughs> so again, again, my view is that when there's ambiguity, we don't want and, and I agree with that. Yeah. Him to make the decision. He should reject it and and it, he's laid out a way forward on the project. It's not said just go away, you can never do anything. Right. And so we need to support that decision. Madam Chair, I would make a move, a motion okay. to um, appeal, uh, to reject the appeal from an administrative decision. I second. Okay. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, and just to clarify, your No discussion. No discussion? No discussion. Your huh? motion is to reject, which would mean deny the deny appeal. The, to de deny the appeal from an administrative decision, which would uphold the code enforcement officer's original decision. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Nay. Nay. Okay, so the ayes have it three to two. The appeal is denied. The decision by the code enforcement officer is upheld. So we can then move on to the next matter. We're not done for the evening? We're not. No, we are not done for the evening. They have a question, though, for us. Yes. Uh, if I may. It is personally 9.15. Yes. There are three or four more items on the agenda. Yes. I'm here for the last one. <laughs> We're probably, uh, yeah, I do the not. The decision at this point is to snowball in hell. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's about as specific as we can be. Um, the you're the very show. last item on the agenda, which was the crossroad matter, is that it? Correct. Yes, that's how I go. Yeah, I mean, you know, I can't say people can magically disappear, withdraw their if the applications, the people can leave, but um, I don't know whether we'll get to that or not. And is the, yeah, is the applicant for that matter here? Yes. The yep. applicant is here. And he, the applicant is remaining, so, yeah. I, you know, I can say looking at the agenda, you can make a calculation as to whether you think we'll get to it. We have 50 minutes. Yeah. To, <laughs> to go 49 through. minutes to get to it. Right. Yeah. Let's move on. Okay. Uh, and you can decide in 15 minutes that uh, right. time I'm, has run out. Mr. Pesse. I've served on this board. I understand what happens. I served the chair for five years. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, so is it? I don't have the agenda in front of me. Yes, Madam I'll read the next the matter. So okay. that the next matter is the application of Brian Grissett this, for your benefit and for the benefit of any uh, members of the public. The application of Brian Grissett for a special exception per Article 4, Section 4.2, Schedule 1, permitted uses, and Article 5, Section 5.2, to permit residential use of the 30.76-acre parcel located 
within the NP Neighborhood Professional Zoning District for the purpose of calculating density for a proposed open space development. <clears throat> the subject properties are located on Route 111 and Tamarind Lane in the R1 Low Density Residential and NP Neighborhood Professional Zoning Districts. Tax map parcels 96-15, 81-57, and 81-53. This is case number 19-18. And that is a special exception or that's a variance request? Special, special, exception. special exception. Special exception, okay. I would propose to have uh, Mr. Brian White of White Appraisal come up because his testimony is germane both to the, the special exception request and the variance quest. And I'd also just ask that all of the testimony that the board has already heard in the context of the uh, appeal of administrative decision be incorporated into its analysis yes. as part of the, you know, the record for this case as well. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. White. Thank you. Uh, yeah. We're we're not the uh, the request for change is to the NP only, and whether or not the the other stuff is in R one is irrelevant. And I'm, I'm I guess what I'm doing is complaining about the reference to R one in the description. I, I'm the property is partly yeah. in R1, so it's properly, I think, described. Well, but well, the there's special a exception, single property yeah. that's <coughs> it's in NP. If, if the property, a single property, was in more than one zone, that's one thing. But the, NG, the NP is all in one of the properties is that correct or not yeah it's in the NP well I, I think it is clear that this exception is for the is it the 37 30.76 acre parcel is that the NP parcel or does yes. that include yes that's so solely the 30.76 acres is respect. the Mendes trust parcel parcel and just to from my perspective anyways I'll stand here so people can see what I think the scope of what we're doing now, we're at a special exception. What we were told by the town is because portions of six lots on the on the yield plan are in the NP, which would include this lot, this lot, because this is the demarcation, okay? R1, NP. So portions of, this, of, of six lots to include this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one, and I've missed one. Oh, yeah, this little triangle right here. Portions of six lots are partially in the NP. So we are depicting a residential use in the MP. Yep. And so that's the scope of the first application. The second application that the board will hear is a variance request, which is the transfer of density. That's later. Yeah, yeah. correct. Okay, so what, so I'm wrong. The sum of the property, the individual, okay, let me back up. From an ownership standpoint, in other words, titles, is it all in one of the ownership plots or not? No. Portions of all six lots, like for example, this lot, there's a big portion of that lot in the NP. It derives its frontage from the proposed subdivision road, which is in the R1. Okay. So it's in both the R1 so in both. and the NP. Hence the reference to multiple. That's why hence the reference in the yeah yeah okay and again this is all academic so for title purposes it'll never look like this we're talking right. about a yield plan a yield plan yep okay right got it okay thank you <clears throat> and again uh mr white's appraisal analysis is relevant for both the special exception and the variance so we figure have them talk at the front instead of bringing them up in both applications and we'll get that out of the way Good evening, how's everybody doing tonight? Fine. <laughs> I did prepare uh, for the Grizzits a uh, opinion letter on the proposed development to, like Justin said, did address uh, variance request and the uh, special exception. And uh, my report is 45 pages in length. There's seven narrative pages, which you've all seen. And I don't want to bore everybody and read through this, but I will uh, hit on some of the highlights as I see it uh, and as to how I came to my conclusion. Uh, this special exception, which is section 52H, 
says that uh, the board of ZBA has to conclude that that use shall not adversely affect the abutting or nearby property values. So in forming my opinion, which again was for both uh, variance and special exception, I put together this letter. I, I'm going to just go through uh, page one through seven that you have uh, paragraph by paragraph touching on the highlights. I talk about the existing property. We, we all know that it's made up of three adjacent parcels with common ownership. Uh, the proposed development is going to have 16 detached single family units and one single family lot coming off of Cullen Way. Uh, it's going to be an open space development. Uh, one thing that wasn't talked about yet tonight is the uh, topography. The 16 uh, lot area of Upland that's going to be developed with the detached residential units uh, has a, a little bit of a sloping terrain down in a north to south direction. Uh, there's a 25-foot uh, vegetated buffer along the, that boundary, and uh, the uh, owners are proposing to put up uh, additional buffers for the lots that are on Graybird Farm Circle. Um, it should be noted that uh, there's dense natural wood and evergreen located along the eastern side of Tamarin Lane, and the subject's hay field, which is the major proposed development area, is not visible from the north or southbound traffic on Tamarin. <coughs> uh, the proposed development is also going to ask, add one single family lot at the end of a cul de sac off of Cullen Way. Um, the development is going to form a homeowners association, it's going to create conservation lands, open space. And there's on-site areas for drainage and wetlands uh, and water runoff. Now, we've talked about in good detail tonight the zoning of R1 and NP and uh, the mixture of the, the neighborhood is one that I would call for this piece uh, a little bit of a mixed-use neighborhood uh, taken in, in total. The, the properties on Kingston Road, you have the town-owned athletic fields, you have office, light industrial units, uh, as you head up more towards the, the property, you have Tamarin Lane, Cullen Way, which is a single-family uh, subdivision of single-family detached homes. Uh, the subject property is like the largest undeveloped property in the area. You've got the Boston Main Railroad, and on the other side of that is the mobile home park. So it's definitely a mixed-use area. Um, I looked through the MLS data and found that Single-family homes in the Tamarind Lane, Cullen Way area have been selling for 369 to 615, uh, 615,000 over the last four years. Uh, and I noted that in the master plan for Exeter, um, this Kingston Road area is identified as a transition area where uh, denser neighborhoods that abut the downtown and the Exeter area and the more rural, rural suburban landscape of the western part of town um, is connected. And subject's mixed-use area is correctly described as a transition area, in my opinion. And the proposed open space single-family development with uh, a developed area and, and a large amount of open space is one that would fit into a transition area. I get into uh, the, the fact that uh, values in the <coughs> surrounding properties, in my opinion, are not going to be diminished by permitting this entire development as proposed. And to come to that conclusion, I considered you know, several factors that typically influence value. Uh, that's view, noise, and the use of the property. Uh, as far as view, there's existing screening that's located uh, between the this property and the uh, abutting residences, and they're going to put in additional screening of a 25-foot buffer area along the uh, Great Bird Circle uh, parcels and along uh, Tamarind Lane. Uh, let's see. I, in determining uh, if there's going to be a value change to the properties, uh, the first thing you look for is paired sales, uh, sales analysis, you know, appraisers, we deal with sales data and you know, you have to find a paired sale where you can hone in on exact changes from one property to another and what 
impact it has on abutting properties. In my opinion, that, that data just doesn't exist uh, in the marketplace. So here I'm uh, just uh, going on my years of experience. I've been appraising commercial residential lots in the seacoast area for 36 years, residential and commercial included. Um, I looked at the uh, owner's plan to sell these detached residential units is going to be in the 400 to 600,000 range, which is right in line with the existing sale prices for the surrounding uh, older homes. And, uh, you know, value enhancement of typical uh, homes of this nature um, is one that would likely at least maintain values, if not upgrade uh, the neighborhood. I, l I looked at uh, noise increases that might be found. And I think previously we talked about the concept plan uh, where Brian was saying it was 67 multifamily units were conceptually proposed for a uh, density requirement. And this is far less than that, obviously, being 16 units and one single family lot. So we're talking about 17 units. Um, you know, any change to this property of use is going to change traffic and it's going to change the nature of the neighborhood to, to some extent. Uh, but this lot, uh, this proposal, this development is much less uh, intense than what could be done uh, by right. Uh, as far as distances from properties, uh, the, the first residence as you come in on this new cul-de-sac road would be more than 350 feet from Tamarind Lane. So that gives you an idea of the, of the distance of a setback. Uh, any development, like I said, in this area would, would create additional noises and um, in my opinion, that the increase of uh, traffic noise to the surrounding properties wouldn't be any more uh, intensive than, than would uh, be found in, in other similarly built up residential neighborhoods in, in Exeter. Uh, I did look at other existing properties and uh, especially properties that had single access roads like this property it does have developments like Greenleaf Drive, uh, Bickford Place, Colonial Way, um, Captain's Way, West Side Drive. And with a single entry access, they're accessing from 42 to 111 single family homes. The increase of or the addition of this property, this development to Tamarind Lane would put the total single family home count to 58 units by the one entry road. So this property would be at 58 units from one access drive and the, uh, the range in the Exeter marketplace that I could find is from 42 to 111. So it's well within the, the range of what's out there in the marketplace. And I could not find any data from those sales to indicate that there was any uh, diminution in value from that intense or size of a development. So after considering all the, the factors of potential negative uh, features or impact on the surrounding properties, you know, noise, use, and view, uh, I concluded that this would be exactly what the master plan calls for, a transition property. It's not pure single family home sites. Uh, but it's not multi-unit mixed-use development, which could be permitted. It's much less intensive a use. Uh, it's going to have some increase on traffic, but so would any other uh, potential use. It's a residential use that's going to enhance the neighborhood. It's going to have retail sale prices that are going to be in line if, or maybe exceed some of the existing homes in the area. And for that reason, I concluded that adding this or permitting this as permitted uh, granting the special exception you know, would not have a diminution on value of the surrounding properties. Are there any questions? Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So, Madam Chair, I would just uh, propose just going through the special exception uh, application itself. 
Um, again, to just to reiterate, we're, real, we're really talking about a special exception for a portion of the six lots can, you know, depicted on the yield plan, which will be in the MP zone. And I think it's important to just point out at the outset what lots we're talking about. And I hopefully you have, we, we provided a yield plan with our application, but for the sake of ensuring we're on the same page, what we're talking about is lot three, which if you're looking at the yield plan, is proposed to be accessed off of the, the proposed extension to Cullen Way. So the cul-de-sac would be extended a bit. So we're talking about lot three, a tiny portion of, of that proposed lot three, as you can see a triangle past the demarcation into the NP zone would be in the NP zone. Lot six, which is proposed to be accessed again off of the proposed extension to Cullen Way. You can see the driveway outlined and the, the window, if you look at the actual lot numbers, that is the, the building envelope that has been identified. So. Lot six, three, six, and seven. Lot seven is proposed to be accessed off the same shared driveway from Cullen Way. The another uh, important thing to note is that the abutter here to essentially the, the east is the railroad. Okay, so, so that's the first three. The second three are up here, 15, 16, and 17. So these proposed lots all dogleg and obtain frontage on the proposed subdivision road, which is up here but they're proposed to be accessed via the right of way, which is permitted in the subdivision regulation and is, has been vetted through the town. So those building envelopes, again, <coughs> are very insulated. They're insulated from the property over here. They're insulated from the town property over here. They're insulated from Graybird Circle. So those are the six properties we're talking about, which I think is, is very relevant to consider and will tie into what I'm about to... Before you, before you yes, sir. walk over there... I don't think you understood my question before. Would you outline where the NP zone is? Not, not the... This bright black line in the middle is the demarcation. This is NP. This is the Mendez Trust property. This entire portion up here is the Grisette property. Okay. So what I was saying before is we're not talking about R1 at all. We're talking about changing, uh, allowing a change to the NP district, full stop. That's all we're doing. What you're doing is going to the next step and saying, here's how we got all these houses in, and some of those go into what is now NP. But your request is just to change the NP. Our request is just for a special exception to depict residential uses in the NP for the totally academic purpose of pro pro Correct. providing a yield plan. But it only applies to that one chunk of property. It oh, this whole the ex special yeah. exception yeah. only applies <coughs> to the, the NP. NP. Correct. No special exceptions required for residential uses in the R zone. Correct. Right. Okay. In the R one zone. Uh, to, it, the way my mind was looking at it was different than the way yours was, and one of us was getting confused. I'm happy <laughs> to say it was me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with that sort of uh, description behind us, you know, with regards to number one, is the current existing use in our situation, again, I would just ask that the board incorporate into this uh, hearing, the, the previous discussion we had in the appeal of the administrative decision. The existing use right now is, you know, on the MP side is just unimproved property. It's just being uh, part of a yield plan to depict portions of six lots. Um, number two, the proposed use and or situation. Again, we have discussed that at length. I would just ask that our previous comments in this capacity be incorporated into this conversation. Um, procedurally, to the extent that we get this special exception and now to the extent that we get the, the variance which is falling on next, we would go to the planning board. We would then undergo the planning process which includes them reviewing this yield plan and determining whether or not, as we previously stated, they are reasonably achievable, et cetera, et cetera. Number three, the, it requires a list of maps and plans, et cetera. We provided that information to the board. Number four is really where the special exception criteria begin. Uh, 4A asks that the use is permitted is a permitted special exception as set forth in Article 4.2, Schedule 1, which of course it is. Residential uses are permitted by special exception in the NP. For Bravo, 
request that the use is so designed, located, and proposed to be operated that the public health, safety, welfare, and convenience will be protected. So as we've tried to impress on the board, the yield plan before you is the product of, of many years of consideration and many concepts. And I think we've also established that the yield plan is reasonably achievable, does uh, recognize the challenges of the property itself to include the wetland issues and access, does, as uh, Mr. Smith testified, comply with all the subdivision regulations. And uh, as, we, as we previously maintained, uh, we did not believe it required a variance. With specific reference to the individual lots, again, three, six, and seven, as I pointed out, which is on the left side of the plan, uh, will be accessed or proposed to be accessed via Cullen Way, while 15, 16, and 17 are proposed to be accessed via uh, the right of way through the Brickyard Condominium. Um, this is important because as I stated, it's very insulated. On the one hand, it's, it's uh, the three, six, and seven are, are bounded to the east by the railroad. And on 15, 16, and 17, those lots are proposed to be, and the, the building envelopes are proposed to be very insulated as well. Um, importantly, we are not depicting a uh, much higher uh, multi-use, which is permitted by right in this zoning district, uh, which we could obtain without any relief from the zoning board, because we are trying to be reflective uh, and acknowledge the, the intention of the master plan, and we are trying to be good stewards of the property itself. Um, we believe that the project and the concept is really a champion of the public health because, again, there's not a higher uh, proposed use that's being proposed. We're proposing large un uh, R1 lots with, with significantly more uh, acreage than what is required under the zoning ordinance because the Grisettes are proposing to convey 32.4 acres to the town proposing additionally pursuant to their open space development plan to conserve 10 acres, all in addition to the 9.3 acres they've already conveyed to the town. And so the summary on this prong is that uh, this is reasonable, this is thoughtful, this has been deliberate, and certainly it's within the public, uh, there's no threat to the public health uh, or, or safety. For Charlie says that the proposed use will be compatible with the zoning district and adjoining post-1972 development where it will be located. And I have watched this board uh, discuss what that prong actually means, but I think that the great weight of the evidence before the board tonight to include uh, our filing itself and also Mr. White's uh, analysis and testimony is that uh, these six units are substantially in compliance with the intent of the zoning ordinance they are compatible with the surrounding areas. They are reflective of the sense of ecological uh, issues with regards to the property. They are specifically in keeping with uh, the goals of the master plan, specifically page 30 and 31 of the revised 2018 version, which talks about this precise parcel being a transition from the more dense downtown and the more rural western part of, of the town. So certainly uh, we would hold that this prong is satisfied as well. Ford Delta says that the adequate landscape, uh, landscaping and screening are provided as required. Um, again, these lots are unimproved and mainly wooded um, and are totally insulated. There's adequate screening uh, from these proposed lots and the houses thereon from, from all uh, abutters, et cetera. So we would posit that this prong is satisfied as well. 4E states that adequate off-street parking and loading is provided and ingress and egress is so designed as to cause minimum, minimum interference with traffic on abutting streets. So again, the important thing to notice here is that with regards to three, six, and seven on the bottom left of the plan, the access is going to be via Cullen Way. With regards to 15, 16, and 17, the access is proposed to be via the right of way through Brickyard. So that is an intentional design to minimize the impact of the traffic and the ingress and egress uh, to the surrounding area and to Tamarind Lane. Certainly there'll be sufficient off-street parking uh, on these lots. For uh, F states that the use conforms with all applicable regulations governing the district where located, except as may otherwise be determined for large-scale developments. We would submit that the use does conform with all the applicable regulations governing the NP 
uh, district. Um, the, the, the loan uh, requirement is to obtain a special exception, again, for the academic purpose of uh, depicting those lots or portions of these six lots on the yield plan. So we would submit that that um, requirement is satisfied. 4G says that as a condition of special exception approval, the applicant may be required to obtain town plan and review and or planning approval of the site plan. Um, we would submit that that's not required here. Again, this is an academic uh, process largely to show that this type of development could be obtained and a special exception could issue so that we could use the yield plan that we have uh, uh, generated. That yield plan, as I've said, will be thoroughly vetted by the planning board. They will determine the ultimate. Uh, they have to affirmatively approve the yield plan before they proceed with their review of our, of our application. So there will be a discussion, it will go through the TRC process, and there'll be a, a, an ultimate decision made by the planning board as to uh, the yield plan and how, it, how many lots it depicts. For now, it's not uh, necessary to go get an extra site plan review on, on these uh, portions of these six lots that uh, appear to be in the NP district. Um, 4H states that the use will not adversely affect abutting or nearby property values. Uh, we would submit that just common sense dictates by virtue of where these uh, portion of these six lots are located, that there's no way that they could impact the surrounding value, uh, uh, the value of surrounding properties. Uh, they are insulated, they are bound by railroads or otherwise totally undiscernible, indiscernible from other residential property. Um, so we would submit that this, this uh, common sense this prong is satisfied, but as you've heard, Mr. White also provided a 40-page appraisal which specifically addressed the special exception and the variance criteria. And in his expert opinion, uh, there was no diminution to surrounding property values. I'm not aware of any evidence to the contrary that has been submitted to the ZBA. Um, certainly we will address any if there is, but to, at this point I'm not aware of any uh, evidence to the contrary on that point. And so we, we would submit that that prong is also satisfied. And then the last two um, criteria under the special exception requirements, uh, I and J, the first dealing with bulk storage and the second dealing with uh, professional uh, technical park district are uh, inapplicable to our application. So we're happy to uh, entertain any questions. Yes. Um, one of the things I'd like to, for everybody's edification, um, I held, uh, and along with some of our neighbors, uh, we sponsored uh, neighborhood um, get-togethers, informational, so people could understand everything and what we were doing, why we were doing it, why we came to this. Um, about half the neighborhood um, agreed and, and did come to become from fully informed. Uh, the other half did not. Um, so you've heard a few comments tonight, which um, shows that, well, what I'd like to show you is, um, and, and what we're looking at, we're looking, I've, I've chosen to go for the special exception to do residential because um, it's best for what's the environment and for my neighbors. Those were the two reasons. And I was able to come up with a way to make it work. Um, but to be cognizant, if I wasn't coming for this special exception, tomorrow, commercial yield bond? The commercial. This is a commercial yield plan of what we could do tomorrow, file for site approval, no variances, no special exceptions, no anything. And included in it, you note know, that there are 24 um, there's 18 units and 24 stalls for parking at this location. Out of the 67 residential units we could put on this property, um, well, what this came up with is that there'd be 36 in the front accessing from here, but there'd be 24 back here. And those 24 legally, we would have the right to connect this. We had this big wetlands in the middle. So due to that hardship, but we would not need variances or anything. But rather than taking these 24 and adding it on, plus 
doing this, keeping this totally separate. This could be separately developed. And then in our, our property, let's, we do the 13 off of this property. So now we'll be looking at 13 plus 24, and we're at 37. And there now, the majority are having to drive through this whole section of the neighborhood. These are all in the NP zone. These 24 are in the NP zone. There's no residential uses re permitted in the NP zone. We could do also, this was based on um, multifamily, but we could, which is allowed by special exception. But these were also designed jointly as multi-use. And that was the point that these could be commercial, multi-use, residential on the second floor. Mr. Pryor, if, I don't, if I'm not mistaken, the definition of multi-use, which is permitted already in the MP, is inclusive of residential uses. It's not specifically mentioned. I think the definition of multi-use is mentioned. Uh, what it says is a single building containing one or more uses permitted within the zoning district in which it is located. In addition to the permitted uses, residential uses are allowed on any level except the street level. Because I've heard both you and Mr. Smith refer to this. We could have done it. Mr. Grissett is now. We could do six. I, I don't see it, but okay, continue. I, I don't understand how you're getting there. But that's immaterial, right. really, because you're not proposing that. No, but, but that was the point I was trying to make is that in regards to development of these parcels, what we've tried to do, and with this special exception, we could go special exception multifamily and do this. But we chose not to go strictly with R1 so it's matching. And that way we'd have the least impact in regards to, now we have the conservation area that works as the um, connector for the wildlife, and we end up having the open space on this property with the least impact on the abutters. So what I guess what I'm saying is the reason I'm going this route under this special exception is because this is what we're proposing tonight is the the least impactful on development on all the surrounding abutters. But before you leave, sure. I understood you to say that if you had your 16 there and the house you have, 17, that was all you were going to do. There's six. There's 16 in the the uh, the, the open space development, the condo. Right. There's uh, is my existing house, and then there's the 17th um, from the yield plan is at the end of column one. So there's a total of 17 new units one of which already exists no that'd be yeah. make it 18 including the existing okay. where our yield plan gives us up to 19. what i what i was trying to get from you is a commitment yeah that you're not going to come back next year and say we changed that to residential and now i'm going to build those other things I, i'm after a commitment from you to never come see us again oh no that the, the whole thing this is about we're requesting a, a residential R1 use for the purposes of doing an open space development as proposed. So that whole That's business right. over and done with. 18 total units. 18 total units, correct. Okay. And with 32 added on to the 11 or the, the nine we already gave to the town and 10. Um, put in open space under the HOA. Yes, that's the commitment. This is over and done with. So that that bit is that big, that con portion called the conservation land is going to be deeded to the town. Correct. So you would not be developing that. No, not at all. That's going to be, that's a condition that we've done is. Uh, this will be the end of. End, over and yes. done with. Okay. Um, I won't have any place to walk ex except with everybody <laughs> else. So we'll just come pick up your chainsaw on the way out, okay? <laughs> <laughs> just very briefly to address the question raised by the board. Part of the charge on Mr. Grisette to obtain a special exception in this context is found in 4B, which requires him to prove 
that the use that he's proposing is so designed, located, and proposed to be operated that the public health, safety, and welfare and convenience will be protected. To the extent that there's any exception taken to the references to other types of development, which would also require special exception as all residential uses to include single family, two family, and multifamily are allowed by special exception. The reason why it's material is because he is proving that he has designed the subdivision by using R1 density in a manner that such that the public health, safety, and welfare are protected. That's the point. That's why it's relative to this board's consideration with specific reference to 4B. So would you object if we condition the granting of the, except, the special exceptions to limit its use solely to calculate the density requirements? Yeah, well, no problem. And that way we don't have to talk right. about the variance because we would solve that problem. I'm happy to not talk about the variance. Uh, I can... <laughs> I need to think through that. Uh, well, can I make a point? I think that I'm just looking at the. We just. I'm looking at the notice, and the notice is specific that it's for the purpose of creating an open. Um, am I looking? At, oh, that's the variance for the purpose of calculating density for the proposed open space subdivision. So I think it's clear. I think it's limited by the you know, it, the request itself is limited, as as you were. Asking. And we're fine with this. This is I've. I've said the word academic 30 times tonight. This is totally academic. See. We're not building that. Right. Uh, I understand that. Yep. But I don't want to grant you a... Uh, Special exception. Uh, the ability mm -hmm. to come back and build these monster things that he wants to build and then not build because he's a good guy. We would be happy with, sense? I think, as Attorney Baum pointed out, we're happy with the scope of the way that this application was referenced in the agenda. We're also happy with a, a condition that says that those portions of those six lots are only to be used for the purposes of the yield plan. We're happy with that condition, too. Okay, but I, I guess what I'm saying is that if our acceptance of your request for... for uh, special exception. This special exception restricts it to a use in calculating the density for your overall project. Mm -hmm. Then, by definition, we've given you what you want on both issues. I don't know. I'm, I'm in this like awkward no, position of like advocating on behalf of the town. I think that the board's decision in the first hearing was that we couldn't transfer density from the NP, NP to the R1. If so the next logical step is to pursue a variance, as, as Mr. Eastman said we needed. Right. No, we, we supported the yeah, fact no. that it came to us for a decision. But that doesn't mean we have to agree with the decision. That's what we're... Well, I think, I think we, decided that, we decided that we decided, that they, need, decided yeah. they need a variance. No. <laughs> we decided they need a variance, they need a variance. He didn't right. decide whether he's going to get a variance yet, because right. that's the next matter. But right. we decided that he needs to seek a variance. Correct. Right. That's okay. what we decided. Be yep. I, and I think the base part of the basis of that was that the burden, it's, a, it's ambiguous, but the applicant mm -hmm. has a burden. And because it's ambiguous, we felt that the burden to overturn the decision wasn't um, I, met. I thought I could speed things up, but I failed. I don't think you can, no, think unfortunately, can. Okay. yeah. Okay. okay. <coughs> I'm, I'm... Okay. To, take Is... to make a motion? No, public. We have... Ah, we left out a step. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Do first... Do we have any questions for the app? Uh -uh. Okay, are there any members of the public who would like to speak? We're now dealing with the request for a special exception. Yes, please. Uh -huh. I can't find one. Special exception. <coughs> Jason Reimers on behalf of uh, Patrick and Ann Flaherty. And I'll be very brief. I want to comment on a couple of the special exception criteria. First is 
5.2C, which is that the proposed use will be compatible with the zone district and adjoining post-1972 development where it is to be located. Um, as we know, you need a special exception to have residential in the NP zone. And um, this size of residential, I think, is not compatible with the NP zone. Uh, special exception for one or two lots might be compatible, but dedicating this 30 acre uh, parcel to residential, I would say is not compatible. And, um, and if this part of the NP really is a transition between the rural and the downtown, um, I think that further shows that it's incompatible to turn it all into residential. Um, <clears throat> with regard to 5.2H, which is that the use shall not adversely affect abutting or nearby property values. Um, I've read Mr. White's um, opinion, and it all seems to be based on the resulting 16 units of condos not having an adverse impact on surrounding property values. But I think the issue for now is whether the yield plan, um, as proposed, would be granted a, a special exception. And there's no evidence in the record that I can see regarding the, the, the yield plan, if built, would not adversely affect abutting or nearby properties. And the burden is on the applicant. Um, there's no, apparently there's been no look at the effect of oddly shaped lots on the neighborhood um, or, or anything based on the yield plan itself. And I know it's academic in a sense, but the academic exercise here could ultimately lead to something actually being built. And so it's academic, but your zoning ordinance creates this academic world in which we need to look at the effects of the yield plan. Not, we're not looking at the end result that the applicant wants, which is the open space subdivision. Thank you. Do, do you do you have a concern that if we grant this, he'll turn around and build what's on his uh, yield plan? Yeah. No, I think the yield plan is. I, am I con with all due respect? I, I don't. I don't think that question gets to where, what the issue is, which is we're required to look at the yield plan as if it would be built and whether it warrants a special exception. And we have to go through the criteria. So they're not proposing to build the yield plan. Um, I'm ultimately concerned about the proposed open space plan. But we have to go through this step first. Okay. Does that answer your question? Well, the, <laughs> we've got the report that says the proposed plan will not have an economic impact. Uh, I, I, I can't follow your logic as to why granting the special exception without figuring out what the cost impact would be of something that's never going to get built would be if it were built. Is that what you're saying? You. Mr. Eastman's decision was that um, de depicting the residential lots in the yield plan requires a special exception. And so in order to determine whether that set special exception would be granted, we need to go through the criteria. Right. And so it's the applicant's burden to satisfy all of these criteria. And what I'm saying is that Mr. White's report isn't addressing the question before the board, which is whether the yield plan residential lots would satisfy the criteria, and specifically section H, which has to do with nearby property values. Okay, and, and that, what, what I think we've said before is it by limiting the approval of the special exception to use in doing the density calculation, that guarantees that the approval we would give for that special exception would not apply 
to actually building the, the plan shown for the density calculation? I, I think, as Attorney Baum mentioned, it's already limited to that use, but we still go through the process because your zoning ordinance requires you to. Okay, well, you guys are lawyers. Well, do you have any, I, I, can I, are you go, good? I'm done. Yeah. I guess, do you, so you, I understand that, I, I completely understand your point that the, mm -hmm. the, you don't think the appraisal addresses the yield plan. Do you have any specific concerns with respect to diminution of plant, property value based on the yield plan? There, there's no evidence in the record Okay. Either okay. way, but there are a lot of neighbors concerned about it. And then also going back to my first point about the um, not being compatible with the zoning district. Okay. Thank you. I, I, actually, anything else? Thank you. Um, very briefly, and I'll let Mr. White respond to the allegation about the report. I think it's a fair characterization of the testimony that you just heard. Uh, that there's no evidence that there'll be any diminution in property value. There are questions and concerns. Uh, questions and concerns is not evidence. The only evidence before the board is expert evidence provided by Mr. White that there will be no diminishment to surrounding properties. And that, of course, squares with logic and common sense, which this board should apply for all the reasons that I've already stated. The, the point that somehow six massive lots in the NP is not compatible uh, with the NP in the surrounding area is, doesn't make sense to me. Uh, the density allowed in the MP is, is one unit per 5,000 square feet. If that was put into that parcel, that would be inconsistent with the surrounding area. This is consistent with the surrounding area as it's been. And as the town has treated this precise parcel over time, remember, this was an industrial parcel that was zoned uh, in 1994, I want to think, I want to say, but Brian will correct me, to, uh, to NP to allow for res residential uses. And now the new master plan is saying this property should be used for transitional purposes. What's being proposed on this yield plan is precisely that. The last point is that... Uh, while this is academic, this could lead to something more in the future. That's, of course, not the case. We've already discussed the scope of this application, and it pertains specifically to the use that these six lots would have on the yield plan for the open space development that has been proposed. So I'll let Mr. Uh, White. With all due respect, I don't think Mr. White needs to say anything because we nothing, all we were saying is that his report only applies to the project as it is going to be built, not as not the conceptual plan. I think that he doesn't agree with that. Oh, and I don't actually agree with it either. Fine. Okay. I keep trying to shorten this. <laughs> <laughs> Brian will be and short. I'll be quick. Uh, on page seven, of the, of when I talk about the uh, requirements for the special exception, I do identify the six lots that are in the NP that would be increasing the density of from let's say 10 potential lots to 16. So I do identify that there are that many units that would be added. And I do conclude at the end that, you know, granting of the special exception, which I understand is adding six more lots or, or density of six more units is not going to have any effect on the value. The difference between six lots and 10 lots in my mind in that area is minimal compared to when we're talking 54, 67 mixed-use units, uh, you know, that that's a big change. Six lots or ten lots on this number of acres um, is a minimal change, and I don't see any difference or any data that would suggest that that's significant, significant enough to say that my opinion would change at all. Thank you. Okay, are there any other members <coughs> of the public who would like to speak? Okay, we'll close public session. Oh, go ahead. Um, so Trevor Nutt, 15 Terman Lane. Um, I have a couple things I wanted to talk about. Uh, first, I second the notion of the Flaherty's representative that the yield plan is inadequate and that it does not um, have an appraisal of the yield plan design. It only includes an appraisal of the final design. Secondly, um, reading through the zoning ordinances in section 5.2 golf, you'll see um, they talk about the fact that the zoning board has the ability to require the planning board and or the town planner to approve the plan um, that has been submitted. And I would request that the zoning board 
uh, presents this to the town planner and or planning board to have this approved. The planning board approval of the site plan prior to rendering a decision on the application. In my opinion, by not wanting a review of the plan, the applicant is concerned the plan may not be viable and reasonably achievable as they have proposed. It would be prudent of the board to request this review of such a large project by the planning board to alleviate the zoning board from responsibility of approving a plan which does not meet the requirements. That's my recommendation to the board to alleviate yourselves of that responsibility of approving a plan that does not meet the requirements. I also think it would set a good precedent for the future that divisions of this magnitude are presented to the planning board for acceptability before they come to the zoning board as it seems to be recommended in the zoning, zoning ordinances. That way we save a lot of time from debating whether or not this is actually acceptable and the planning board can do their review of that. Um, third and my last uh, point here, um, it would be prudent of the board to reject the conclusions of exhibit four, the appraisal, as it pertains to conclusions regarding factors that impact market value of abutting properties based on a review, concluding the appraisal is based on inconclusive evidence, speculation, and a non-performance of an appraisal of, a, of proposed properties. With that being said, I'd like to point out, um, if the board doesn't mind, just a couple items in the appraisal which to me did not align with the proper um, uh, method of completing an appraisal. The first one would be on uh, page five, actually the bottom of page four and the top of page five. At the bottom of page four, it states, according to Brian Grissett, the anticipated asking prices for the proposed residential homes would be from the mid 400s to $600,000. I don't think an appraisal company should just be taking a, you know, estimated proposed values of homes from the contractor that intends on building them to then verify that their plan is adequate and does not affect the surrounding values of the neighborhood. Uh, one other thing that I did wanna mention that's in the, um, in the appraisal that we've talked a little bit about tonight is the master plan. Again, it states that the um, master plan addresses the subjects Kingston Road area, identifies Kingston Road as a transition area between the denser neighborhoods that abut the downtown area of Exeter and the more suburban rural landscape of the western part of the town. The master plan goes on to state that the new development on Kingston Road in this area should provide the transition needed from the two residential areas. Transitions occur between areas, not within the middle of them, as would be the case when you access this property from Tamron Lane. So that was my other concern. That's it, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yes. Again, Jonathan Elliott, 6 Tamron Lane, and again, I'll be brief. Uh, I just want to just clarify one thing, and that's uh, point to the process that Mr. Eastman laid out in, in the steps here and make sure that we are all understanding what those steps are. Um, believe the special exception is needed first to change the use and that variance is required to allow for the transfer of density. The way that this is currently written, this application, uh, page two, paragraph two, special exception um, is being utilized to depict portions of the six parcels for the purpose of uh, calculating permitted density. So just to clarify that and what exactly is being uh, approved here by special exception. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else from the public who'd like to speak? Okay, we'll close public session and begin deliberations. Mm -hmm. Okay.
Okay, so uh, are there any particular concerns, or should we just? I just well, want to go off subject for one minute yeah. and say it's gone past 10 p.m. Yes, I. And I, for those people who are waiting, I, you know, we're not going to start other. With one exception, I yeah. would ask that at the end of our deliberations for this, we take up the matter of the Great Bridge yes. Properties Yes, oh, the Great Bridge Properties. You want which has already been delayed once and is really a pro forma uh, reapproval of something that we already approved. Right. We're all in agreement already. We just had to go through the formal Exactly. Step. And so I don't want that to be delayed another month. Okay. So at the well, end the of our deliberations on the special exception, I would ask that the board make an exception to the our own rules of procedure about not opening a new case and oh. take that one out of turn. Okay, okay. well, the well, only problem is might there be people who have left because... Anyway. That's why I tried to catch it at 10. Yeah. May I ask, um, is there anyone in the room other than the applicant who is concerned with the application of Great Bridge Properties, LLC? They may have left. They left? No. He said they may, they have, have, left. may have left. Oh, okay. Considering well, the, other, the, well okay. yeah, I mean the other issue is well, I guess that might take a while, but we still have the variance request. I we know. want to. Can I? Yeah, I think we should. We're in deliberative. We Why don't we finish okay. the special exception, and then I think we should discuss the variance request and the Great yeah. Bridge. And at that point, yeah, close it because I think it will be easier to pick up address the variance request now while agreed. We're, Okay. Agreed. Instead of revisiting yep. this whole matter right. again in Let's, another month. Oh, no, 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 no. We would still continue with oh, the variance. I'm just saying that is, is because that is... They won't have yeah, to come back. Exactly. Okay. Yep. All right. right. So back to the special exception. Um, does any... I mean, it seems pretty... It's laid out very well in the application. I would notice that some of the numbering is a little off, but yeah, the right. titles are the same, so right. they match the, up with what the actual regulation is. Um, I think that's part of our special exception application. Oh, is it? Is I that the way it's it written? Yeah. Okay. But anyway. So that might be out of date or something. Um, so this is a special exception to permit residential use so of just this property. I think the one, there were a couple issues brought up mm -hmm. by the public that um, one was that the appraisal didn't really directly address the yield plan. And I think many of the points discussed were common to both. Yeah, I would think. And so, I mean, to me, that's not, me. you know, I, I'm satisfied with the testimony. And I think it was also addressed by the applicant's um, attorney yes. that, you know, there's each of the potential lots, their access and so forth, why that um, wouldn't impact other properties. So I don't feel like it wasn't discussed. I feel like I think it was discussed to get, yes. Okay. Might have Just wanted to mind. bring that up. Okay. The other point, I think, what was the other point? The, um, I can't remember. Sorry. Um, I, don't know. I don't remember what point it was in reference to, but the attorney made the mention that the, um, uh, the existence of six lots on this property was excessive. Oh, that it wasn't compatible. And which probably would have been compatible, would have been A, proposed use will be compatible with the zone district and adjoining post seven. I think if you consider the oh. nature of the the wetlands and the topography and so forth, I think it's as compatible as you can get, given the, the type well, the, of land. It's so also, I, yeah. I'm not too concerned about the compatibility aspect It seems either. to be consistent with is. the master plan also. Is exactly. The applicant But we're talking suggested. about a 30-acre plot and it's involving six residents six but it's in the back of the plot where it's access is challenging and there's a lot of wetlands so no it's in two distinct portions of the 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 parcel under consideration is strictly right. the 30 acre mendez property right. uh and the 30.76 acre mendez real estate property 8153 and the proposed yield plan does 
um, have for the six properties. Six properties. Part of that. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. So. So not all at the back as it were. Two of them are. Six and seven were at the back. Three's just touching a piece, and the other three were uh, toward the front of the property, actually. Yeah. I mean, there are, so, I mean, I think there are some real issues as far as the, the you know, obviously you couldn't build this. I think that's, that's an issue that, that needs to be addressed here. This is not realizable. We have no input as to whether or not um, you'd be able to build. I, I believe I heard that the driveway access easement that would extend from the brickyard condos would require a wetlands crossing. Uh, there's no guarantee that such a thing would be allowed, for example, um, which would make lots 15, 16, and 17 not buildable. I think that's really a plan to the planning board. It, it, it is. The reasonableness yeah. of it. The issue is just whether use. Right. It's just that, use. And I think the specific use right. for this project. Right. But it is asking us to approve six, which will be yes. which will then be transferred, which will impact right. the amount of the, the size of the development that is actually allowed to be built. Is it asking us to approve six or is it asking yeah. us yeah. to Yeah, it is. It's the it's those lots. They yeah. They specified, I believe. Right. There are six different lots that touch on the 30.76 acres in the NP zone. Yeah, to depict portions right. of six large conventional Right. So lots. I'll deny the special exception. They can still build on, but not to the same extent. Right. They And, and the variance becomes moot because you're not transferring any uh, density from the NP to the, um, to the R1. Right. But that means that that 30 acres of land will still be in the wind in the sense that they can come back with a, a project that involves that. Well, yeah. Yes, but yeah, I don't want but... us to be fooled by the numbers that we've had thrown around of 54 or 67 or whatever it was, because I, I'm not sure how that was arrived at. We've had no... Uh, specific evidence that I, that was I agree at. I agree I think that's a number that's right if you if you read the regs it says multi-use can include residential uh, on any level except the street level which means it must be a multi-use so I don't know I have no idea what the density would be. Okay. Well, and, it, and I don't think it's germane to this I don't think to it, yeah. this application I don't think it is either and I, th I actually think that the, it shouldn't even have been mentioned by the applicant probably because it's yes I agree it's that, kind that of was a, a concept makes use plan. productive right agreed so do we want to go through the so criteria yeah. or are yeah. we we should go through them. the fact that it's in written form here and been already well, we covered. can reference the application I think we don't have we to, to, in our approval, we don't have to talk about the six structures. No. All well, we have to do is say... As, as applied. We grant a special exception for the residential use of six... Uh, in, for the purpose of calculating the density in the proposed... That's correct. ...open space development. So why don't we, just because of the nature of this application and... and, and We've spent this much time. Let's go through the criteria. Okay. So yeah. first, the use is permitted special exception. Um, it is. Yes, that's clear. Um, that the use is so designed, located, and proposed to be operated that the public health, safety, welfare, and convenience will be protected. Uh, I think that's met for the reasons that were stated. We're talking, you know, it's six, six residential lots on, on 30, roughly 30 acres. Portions uh, of six. Portions of six right. on roughly 30 acres. Um, you know, there's, it, you know, there is access shown. Um, we don't have to, you know, the final approval, if this was ever approved, you know, the review of traffic, review of, you know, the driveway access, turning radius, all that is a planning board issue. But, you know, it, so we're, we're basically focused on the residential use, and a residential use is not going to... Uh, you know, six residences is not going to impact the health, safety, right. welfare, and convenience. Um, that the pros uses will be compatible with the zone district and adjoining post site 272 development. Um, it, it, these are permitted by special exception. This is a transitional area, as you know, as discussed with the master plan. It abuts a residential area. Um, you know, it's basically a continuation of residential um, at, and consistent for that reason. Uh, adequate landscaping and screening are provided. Um, 
again, given the size of these lots and, and the, you know, the, the current state, that, that won't be an issue. Um, adequate oxygen parking and loading, ingress and egress is designed to cause minimum interference. Um, there's plenty of off street parking, um, and there are, you know, the, they have shown that there's access to these lots. Um, the use conforms with applicable regulations governing the district where located, except as may otherwise be determined for large scale developments. Um, again, that's, that's repetitive to the yeah. earlier ones, and right. the use is permitted by special exception. Um, as a condition, the applicant may be required to obtain plan or review or review, approval of site plan. I, you know, I agree with the applicant in this case. It, it doesn't it doesn't make sense to apply where we know a subdivision, no matter what, even if they actually went through with this, and then we know that it's academic, subdivision review would occur, which means planning board review is going to occur. It's required. Ha have an additional site plan just doesn't make sense. Uh, and that the use will not adversely impact abutting or nearby property values. I think we've discussed that. There's an appraisal and support. Um, you know, I, I, I agree that, you know, six lots on 30 acres is not going to have a negative have earth effect just based on common sense. Plus, you know, there was no, you know, nothing else presented um, that there, no other evidence presented or even testimony made that there would be an adverse effect. Um, and the other two, the other two criteria do not apply. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> do yes. Okay. <coughs> Would someone like to make a motion? Um, I'm moved that we um, approve the application for a special exception as as applied, as presented. As presented. Thank you. Um, second. I'll second. Any discussion on the motion? We've said as presented, but I wonder if we want to amend it to, to actually say for the purposes of, okay. include for the purpose of calculating a density for a proposed open space development. For the sole right. For the purpose. sole purpose. Okay. So do you want to... Make that amendment, Bob? Did we um, want to move to amend the motion? No, what you just said with the addition of the word sold. But we have to... We have right. to amend the motion. I'll, right. If you would like to make a motion... I'll make a amend. motion to amend that. Right. <laughs> to amend. Second. By adding the words. To amend, to add the words, for the sole purpose of calculating density for a proposed open space subdivision. I will second the amendment. Any further discussion on the amendment? Okay, all in favor Aye. of the approved, I mean of the amended? No, of the amendment, of and the then we'll back out okay. to, the, to the motion. Okay, Okay. any discussion Thank of the you. amendment? No. Nope. All in favor of the amendment? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, did you did say everyone aye? Say everyone, aye? yeah. Oh, okay. Aye. okay, five, so no, we now have an amended motion. Okay, for so. Discussion. Any discussion of the amended motion? Motion, which is to approve, which is to approve this special application for special exception as presented for the specific purpose of calculating density for the proposed open space development. Okay. No discussion. No discussion. Um, all in favor? Aye. Did we second the motion? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. The special exception is granted. Okay, so we were going to go on to the variance request. Do we want to take a break? Or does anyone want to take a break first? Mm -hmm. I know it will extend our time, but we have been sitting here for a while. I'm good. I've got to go. Since, yes, Laura, denied, <laughs> since Laura denied me water earlier, I'm finish. fine. Okay. All right. Okay. Applicant, please. The application of Brian Grissett for a variance from Article 4, Section 4.3, Schedule 2, Density and Dimensional Regulations, Residential, and Article 7, Open Space Development, to allow for the residential de unit density <coughs> permitted in the NP Neighborhood Professional Zoning District to be transferred to an adjacent property located in the R1 Low Density Residential Zoning District for the purpose of creating an open space development. Properties are located on Route 111 in Tamarind Lane, tax map parcels 
and 81-53, case number 1919. Mr. Passe. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, Justin Passe again, uh, DTC Lawyers and Portsmouth on behalf of uh, the applicant. I would just procedurally up front here ask that the board just incorporate into its uh, consideration all the evidence that is here, it's heard uh, tonight thus far. Um, and then because, you know, circumstance has, has led us to this point in the evening, um, I would just ask at the out front to consider just generally the nature and purpose of variance relief in New Hampshire. And I think uh, that a good way to characterize that is to ensure that zoning ordinances are applied to individual properties in a fair way. And that's a layman's way to talk about it, but I think uh, that's the fairest and most accurate way to summarize um, variances in New Hampshire, because at the root of all of this are individual property rights, which people in New Hampshire uh, hold very dear, and rightfully so. And I think it's very relevant that on the question that was first before the board tonight regarding the appeal of the administrative decision, this board was very torn about what the zoning ordinance says, about how it should be applied to this case, um, and I would ask the board to sort of reflect on those, uh, those thoughts and on that deliberation because I think it's germane here. So to set this thing up, we did uh, request, uh, we, requ we asked Mr. Eastman from which zoning uh, ordinance we needed relief. His response was that essentially the, that what we were proposing, this quote unquote transfer of density was not allowed. Um, and so it was uh, prohibited, but we don't have, we didn't have a specific uh, regulation to seek relief from. So in an abundance of caution, we sought relief from section 4.3, schedule two, which is the density requirements and then the entirety of the uh, open space development ordinance, article seven. And um, again, all of this is to, to simply permit the grisettes to utilize the depicted residential uses on the NP in their yield, yield plan for the purposes of their open uh, open space development plan, which will be reviewed and vetted by the planning board as this board just discussed in the deliberation on the last case. So just turning to the variance criteria, as the board uh, knows, generally the first and second criteria are taken together and those are whether or not the variance will be contrary to the public interest and whether or not granting the variance will observe the spirit of the ordinance. And in that context, uh, a variance is only contrary to public interest if it unduly and in a marked degree conflicts with the ordinance's basic zoning uh, uh, zoning objectives. And so I would just, I would point out from the start and really based on the deliberation and the process that we went through earlier, that not only does this proposal not unduly conflict, it doesn't really conflict. And, and fair people on both sides of this perspective had different determinations about what the, fair, the zoning ordinance uh, does and does not say. So as a preliminary matter, what's being proposed does not, even in letter, uh, expressly conflict with the zoning ordinance itself. But the Supreme Court has given us two specific tests to consider in the context of these first two variance criteria, and those are whether the, the, the essential character of the neighborhood is being uh, altered by what's being proposed in the variance, and whether uh, the variance would threaten the public health, safety, or welfare. So the point of the open space development ordinances to encourage flexibility in design and development, to promote the conservation of open space and land, to preserve natural and scenic qualities, to encourage conveyance of land and easements for use by general public, to preserve sites with high ecological value, and to create contiguous network of open spaces by linking common open spaces. So again, I would submit that not only are we not conflicting with the general purposes of this zoning ordinance and the zoning ordinance in question, we are advancing them. Uh, the proposal advances the objectives of the zoning ordinance when it comes to open space uh, development. This is the precise type of property and the precise area where open space development is encouraged, in fact, required by the zoning ordinance. Uh, there are 16 units being proposed. Uh, there are 32 acres that are proposed to be conveyed to the town. An additional 10 acres are going to be uh, preserved by the Homeowners Association as the Grisettes have preserved that same 10 acres over the last 30 years. So we are connecting open spaces. We are very sensitive to the ecological value of the property as Mr. Gove pointed out. And I would just advance that the proposal here is not only not in conflict with the ordinance, it <coughs> furthers the alternatives and the objectives of the uh, zoning ordinance. 
It also doesn't uh, conflict with the essential character of the neighborhood, as we've discussed uh, at, at length, and as is indicated in Mr. White's report. We're talking about a modest number of units to be added in an area where um, this development has been contemplated and indeed prepared and planned for 30 years. Uh, there's a significant buffer between the proposed open space development and the residents on Tamarand Lane. Uh, the residents along Greybird Circle were all individually uh, advised by Mr. Grisette at uh, the time that the lots were uh, conveyed that uh, the uh, follow-on uh, development would occur. Um, tasteful homes are being proposed, as Mr. Grisette and uh, Mr. White discussed. And again, uh, this proposal is consistent with the changes uh, recently made to the uh, master plan insofar as they serve that purpose of being the transition between the more dense area downtown and the more rural areas in the western part of town. Beyond that, there is no threat to public health uh, or safety. As we've indicated, this is a conservative plan. Uh, Mr. Smith testified earlier this, this uh, evening that Tamarind Lane itself was over-engineered, wider than what is normally required in Subdivision Road in the town of Exeter, and that the trip generation uh, from the proposed open space development will not have a, a deleterious effect on the surrounding area. Uh, so, in, in summary, in, in, in addition to what we have outlined in, uh, for the remainder of the evening and in our filings with the board, because there won't be any uh, alteration to the essential character of the neighborhood, and because there will be no threat to the public health or safety, uh, the spirit of the ordinance is met, and the variance will not be contrary to the public interest, uh, those being the two tests that the Supreme Court has outlined. Uh, the next criteria is whether or not substantial justice is done. The test there is whether any loss to the Grisettes is outweighed by gain to the general public. So there has to be some gain to the public from denying the variance that's requested that outweighs the loss to the Grisettes. So here, uh, there is obviously a significant gain uh, for the Grisettes, as we've talked about at length. This is the actualization of a near 30-year uh, development plan coming to fruition, um, and this, this will actualize the vision for the property that, that has been maintained uh, from the beginning. It will preserve large swaths of ecologically sensitive land. Um, it will provide the town and, and the public the opportunity to enjoy the property as Mr. Grisette has. So those types of considerations are obviously inuring to the benefit of Mr. Grisette. In the alternative, the other side of the analysis is the gain to the public. And I don't see a discernible gain to the public. Uh, this was anticipated development. As Mr. White and Mr. Smith has testified to, the impact will be minimal. Um, there are 42 acres of property that will be conserved into perpetuity in the town of Exeter, which is a great benefit to the public. And it, it is avoiding other alternatives, which for better or for wor worse, are technically possible on the property and could be pursued. So all of those things, I think, culminate in the, in the ultimate balance of the scales analysis that when considered in total, this is a big benefit to the Grisettes that has been in the works for a long time. And there's not a discernible, clear, express piece of evidence uh, that it will somehow inure to the benefit of the public such that granting the variance should not happen. Uh, the next criteria is whether or not the values of surrounding properties will be uh, diminished. And again, as I've posited, uh, I think common sense dictates that based on the specific design of this open space development, uh, tucked up into the upland uh, in, in that upper corner of the plan, away from Tamarind Lane, in a space that was always contemplated for <coughs> additional development, that this is uh, consistent with, with the plan that's always been in place and will not affect uh, surrounding property values. I think that's also consistent with the only expert testimony that we have here tonight, uh, which states unequivocally over the, over the course of 40 pages that this development will not impact surrounding property values. And I think it's important to note that Mr. White's analysis went into detail with regards to other subdivisions in the town of Exeter, which have had quote unquote secondary development off of them to uh, include uh, uh, um, uh, the, the property on 111A, I'm drawing uh, Greenland Drive. Um, so I think the point is, is well taken that this type of uh, development has been analyzed on other subdivisions in Exeter 
And from an expert's perspective, there will be no diminution in the property values of surrounding uh, properties, which I think is consistent with common sense. I mean, so the last criteria, uh, that being the hardship criteria, there are really two tests under this criteria. And the first one is whether due and owing to special conditions of the property in question that distinguish it from other properties in the area, there is no fair and substantial relationship between the general public purpose of the ordinance and its application to the property. Uh, and the second component of that test is that the use is reasonable. And this is really what I started out with uh, tonight. The question here is, does it make sense to interpret the zoning ordinance in a manner that makes it so that he cannot, the Grisettes cannot transfer the density uh, of these six lots in the NP to further his yield plan and open space development? I think the answer there has to be no. There are significant special circumstances with regards to the property. If you look at them in the tax map that we provided, both of them at 23.4 acres on the one hand and 30.76 acres on the other are significantly larger than any property in the area. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that there are significant wetlands on the, on the property themselves and they're ecologically sensitive as Jim has noted. So the areas of upland are really, uh, uh, are located where the proposed development are, is designed to be uh, uh, located. With regard specifically to the Mendes Trust property, mention was made about its location in the NP. I think it's important to note that the point of the NP is for there to be significant frontage on public roads to account for things like medical offices and professional offices. This property has no frontage. It has access uh, from Kinston Road via a right of way. So I think it's in keeping with the transition that the, the town has had on this property over time. Again, the Brickyard Condominium property in general was initially industrial. The town has moved that property away from being industrial towards a more transitional area. It's in the neighborhood professional district. But what are, what are the chances that that property would ever be uh, uh, developed pursuant to a neighborhood professional type use? Again, the idea in that district is lots of frontage, professional medical type offices, and a trans transitional zone. So that property in particular is just burdened by its circumstance. It's landlocked <coughs> and it's accessed via a right of way from 111. Um, for those reasons, I think those, these properties uh, are particularly situated and very special and have unique characteristics. And they apply in this hardship criteria, but they also make it so that the open space concept is perfectly well suited uh, for the reasons that I've already uh, articulated. So because the proposal is consistent with the intent of the zoning ordinance in every respect, I think the hardship should be found to exist because there's no point of the zoning ordinance that's be advanced by prohibiting the, the variance. The, the purpose of, of no provision in the zoning ordinance is being advanced by not allowing this type of uh, transfer of density, as Mr. Eastman put it. And also, uh, you know, the proposed use is reasonable. It's exactly consistent with what is required under the law. The, op the open space development is in the R1. The parcel is larger than 20 acres. It has to be an open space development. It's consistent with the master's plan. It's consistent with the <coughs> decades long planning that has gone into this uh, process. And I would also say that the proposal uh, meets the second criteria, the second test within the hardship criteria, which is really the old standard of the, of the hardship criteria in New Hampshire. And it basically states that whether due and owing to special conditions of the property that distinguish it, again, from others in the area, the property cannot be used in strict conformance with the ordinance, and a variance is therefore necessary to enable a reasonable use of it. And I think under the circumstances here, a variance is required to enable a reasonable use of uh, particularly the Mendez Trust property. Because as I said, <coughs> there is no frontage, it's accessed via uh, a right of way, it's burdened by uh, significant wetlands and other ecological sensitivity. And so the only way to really use this property in a meaningful way is to have it be part of an open space development and to derive some density for it, all so that ultimately the applicant can convey the thing to the town for the use of the public. So I really think that this is a proposal that is very beneficial for the public, um, and it's something that's in keeping with the spirit of what the Grisettes have been trying to do uh, for a long time, and, and it has been approached in a very sensitive and respectful manner. And I think of all the variance cases, especially in light of the way that the board handled the first application tonight, this is the perfect example for why variance uh, relief exists, and uh, we think it should be applied here. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, 
Mr. Grissett, did you want to speak? Oh, okay. And then we'll go to members of the public. Yeah, um, just to add a little bit more detail, um, in regards to this being MP property um, and the, the two hardships involved, um, the, the natural features that you can see on the map, there, it's been discussed by Jim, the wetlands, the major wetlands, um, Skim and Brook, a waterway intersects the property. In addition, there's another wetlands that um, intersects the access right of way uh, for another 150 feet. Um, when in 1973, when this property was originally, uh, when the zoning was originally put into place, um, the original zoning map, when they created the industrial zone, the original zone, actually it was they, where the brickyard condominiums are now. And it was basically the line was drawn. It ignored, it, it ignored um, property lines. What they did was they measured out uh, 1,100 feet and they drew a point on Kingston Road and they went down, but it, they went back on an angle. And so they went back only to Scam and Brook. Past Scam and Brook, this was zoned R1. And then the, the, NP, uh, the industrial zone went across and followed Scam and Brook over to the Little River. Um, that line they drew back to Scam and Brook, only 25% of this property that is now totally NP was actually in the industrial zone. The other was originally R1. Then there was a lot of issues with, um, for the planning board where you had split zones on the property. So then there was a major change where they went back and redrew the district lines based on property lines. But this time they ignored the natural features. So since the front part was already industrial, they made the whole thing industrial. And the unique thing about this property and following the history, the next time it was changed uh, in 94, um, it was changed from industrial to NP and the stated purpose was to make it more compatible with the surrounding residential. Um, at that point in time, it was strictly, uh, it was not retail, it was office, uh, professional offices. Three NP zones were created in uh, 94. Uh, in total, in the end, there were three. Um, there was the original on, uh, out on Hampton Road. There are a total of 35, I guess my, my point is, let me show you the map. In regards to the uniqueness of the property, um, these three yellow spots are the total of the MP properties, uh, three districts in the town of Exeter. There are only a total of 35 properties. The average depth ranges between 400 to 800 linear feet. The average is about 600. I think it's the average 550 um, on Hampton Road. Um, all of the, they're all less than 500 feet in depth. Out here on the uh, Beach Hill Epping Road, they're less than 400 feet in depth. When this standalone parcel, this zone down here, was created, and they just converted <coughs> the industrial to MP, our property that we're talking about with no frontage, no signage rights, no utilities, doesn't start until 825 feet back and is totally contrary to the idea of having a commercial development back there. It was inappropriate. So, for, and the planning board and the master plan committee have recognized that in 2000, in 2002, in 2008, there has been a change in which the planning board has changed the, the actual uses. We went from strictly uh, professional offices, then they added in mixed use, now they've added retail, or resi excuse me, residential uh, in 2017. So, and the master plan in the latest version has specifically been pushing and identifies that this particular property, ours, <coughs> is specifically singled out and saying that due to the environmental limitations, it should be used to act as the transition uh, property. So that's what we're saying. We're trying to comply with what the planning board has been talking about for the past 20 years. And so, 
and because there is that hardship. So we believe, we request that you approve. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, members of the public would like to speak. Good evening, I'm Bob Leitz, live at uh, 3 Tamarin Lane. Sorry, what is your last name, sir? Leitz, L-I-E-T-Z. I just wanna to speak to the essential <coughs> character of the neighborhood argument. 16 condominiums in a cluster, like they're proposing, affects the character <coughs> of the neighborhood. The neighborhood we live in is not that. So for them to stand up and say, this is, right in line with the character of the neighborhood, in my estimation, is disingenuous. We have a neighborhood where it's homes that are on an acre, two acre lots minus a two acre lot. And what they're proposing is a, a cluster of homes right across the street from my house where they'll be pulling out. And it's just not consistent with the neighborhood at all. <coughs> and so I just really think we need to take a hard look at what they're proposing in that regard as it pertains to this request. I can envision a few homes down there, two, three, four. That would be consistent with the neighborhood. A cluster of 16 <coughs> condominiums does not fit that criteria. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? Yes, please. <coughs> As in Attorney uh, Passe's October 28th letter to Mr. Eastman, he noted correctly that a variance should not be easy to obtain. The applicant has to satisfy all of the criteria, and carry the burden. And here the applicant has presented arguments that the open space development itself satisfies the variance criteria. But the applicant should be demonstrating how the yield plan satisfies the variance criteria. But moving on to the variance criteria nevertheless, both the yield plan and the open space development would alter the essential character of the neighborhood. Mr. White said that this w development would change the neighborhood somewhat. There'd be more traffic noise, and especially for my clients, uh, the Flaherty's, uh, through their property is the road that all the uh, owners of the condos would travel to reach their condos. Um, this open space proposal would put a 16 condo development on a very small area right in the Flaherty's backyard. And let me just show you on the plan where their house is. Clarity's house is right here. So that would put all of these condos right in their backyard. And I would say that common sense says that the placement of those condos will adversely affect the property values of at least the Flaherty's house. Um, we just heard from another nearby neighbor who has similar concerns about the entire neighborhood. He may have the same concerns about his property values. As for hardship, the applicant has demonstrated tonight that there are other ways that they could develop the property. Um, this is not the only way that this property can be developed. This would not be um, a governmental taking, preventing them from using their property. Um, that's not, um, I don't think, a reasonable support for this variance. And so for these reasons, the variance application should be denied. Thank you. Can I ask you something? Yeah. You say in their backyard, how actually how close is this to their property and what is in between their prop property and the condo? There's some trees. I, I'm not sure if this plan is the I, sorry, same one. Oh, to, yes, I'm sorry. Can you, you need to identify yourself? You? Sorry, I'm Ann Flaherty. I'm 8 Tamarin Lane. I'm not sure if the plan you have here, Brian, is the same as ones I've seen in terms of the distance from the property line. This is the latest one that was uh, done. Can you give him the mic if he's going to speak so I he can be recorded? The, the distance. Yeah, the, the, when we sold this house, uh, when we constructed this house on this lot, um, the house is, this corner point is 20 feet 
from the road. You have a from the property line. From the property line. Um, and then you have the vegetated buffer. This was a pre planted vegetated buffer on our side. There's also one on the other. And then this is existing forested area. So there's buffer and forest. So it would yeah. be about 75 feet okay. between my property and the next property. Okay. The next building. The proposed, the next proposed building. Which would be yes. building one on the concept site plan. Okay. Yes. Okay, so she, I see it. I so see it now. On building to building, it would be That's 75 feet. This is it. Okay. And that distance from there to there is about 70 feet. Okay. If she's 20 feet off the property line. Between yeah. the buildings, right? Yes, she's between the buildings. Uh, okay. This is buffer. This is the development. Would either you or your attorney kindly address the issue of the access oh, road sorry. being on your property? Yeah, the access road. Um, I I can attempt to forgive me. I'm I'm new to this. Uh, uh, that's and fine. I'm that's a why I said either you point. or your attorney. I well I don't I don't know. So there's there's a lot of questions I think about exactly how it's going to work. Um, and, and this is a little different than other plans that I've seen um, that was originally submitted, I think, to the zoning board. I think it may have changed. I don't recall seeing a separate driveway. So um, I, I think this is depicting my home having a driveway that is now separated from the access road. Um, previously, it had been a, my driveway had turned into the access road. Um, so there certainly would be concerns related to, say, public safety, meaning my family and my children in, in that case. Um, so I'm, I'm not intimately familiar with what this plan looks like or exactly how it would be constructed or what the safety mechanisms to make sure that the driveway and the road are are, are safe. Okay. Would be. Can, but there is an easement on your the, property. Yeah, yes. So as stated at the beginning, there is a 75 foot, 75 foot wide um, right of way. Um, I think my husband and I are still trying to figure out, which is why we have an attorney, right, <coughs> that the, uh, the legal uses and ramifications of that in a lot of ways um, to make sure that, that everything complies and that our rights as property owners are protected. And I, I don't have solid answers as to that at this moment. But and your address is on Tamarin Lane and your driveway does come out on Tamarin Lane. Indeed, yes. At approximately the same location as the proposed... Yes, it is, that is the right of way. The way the, the property is, there's a very steep um, uh, incline from the road going down for much of the 75 feet. So it's sort of pushed up against um, the property that's towards six tamarind. Um, Closer to 101. Yes. Closer to 101, yes. rather. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Can maybe Mr. Grissett, do you, where, can you tell us where the access road would be in relation to her yes property um, driveway. this plan is slightly different there have been three there have been four variations um, uh, earlier on we also had a lot line adjust we were doing a land swap uh, we were we had met with the Flaherty's um, discussed their concerns um, I thought excuse me informal okay um, the long and short we, we come up with different plans, trying to increase buffer, um, doing a transfer. There was a concern about liability on the roadway. Uh, it's a private right of way. But to go back on the, the history just a little bit, the statement regarding a diminution of value, um, every single one of the lots that has been raised, this issue of buffer and impact, um, there are two separate sections, this section and this section. No one in this neighborhood can see this development. Those of you who went on the sidewalk and the others um, could not see it. I have photographs from the street now in the winter which um, you can't see the location where the homes are going. Um, the roadway going in. Um, but in regards to these uh, three lots mm -hmm. and specifically the Burnhams, each one of these owners, we developed these. So it's 10 but minutes to 11. It? We want to know about Just the roadway. Just where's the road? Okay, where's the the road? roadway is now. We have preserved their driveway. We are now approximately um, 12 to 15 feet. The roadway has been moved from the last rendition and moved down. So to give further screening for Mr. Letts across the street, which we also offered to provide screening. And so we're coming up in the straight shot here. There's a slightly more wetlands impact. 
as a result of not going where originally proposed, um, but this is for the benefit of their lot. So it's, does their so driveway the now make it to the road without yes. intersecting your access? That is correct. Okay. It's okay. The, That's good. And this yep. is a new access. Thank road. you. It's, yep. There's it, no road there right now. There, the existing road currently um, is jointly shared by their driveway going okay. back, and it forked in a Y and goes on to okay. our property, where we've maintained that right away for 30 years. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? Yes. I'll keep it brief. <laughs> it's getting late. I'm Lisa Blyken. I live at 11 Tamarind Lane. Um, I just wanted to echo some of my fellow neighbors' comments. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment. Um, first, I wanted to mention that we do have a neighborhood petition in opposition to the project. And one of the specific concerns that our neighbors um, agreed with and signed on about um, was a concern about potential property value impact and the nonconformity of lot size and character with the surrounding established homes. Um, there are currently 15 homes on Tamarind Lane, so this project would effectively double the number of homes. Um, if you include this variance in the, the density transfer. Um, I have a copy of the petition and um, a list of those in the neighborhood who have signed on. I'm happy to give you a copy for the record if you Is like this, one. We received um, a letter dated November 18th. Is that different from what you have? Yeah. It's okay. different. Yeah. I think it's different. Okay. This Who is, is that from? Okay, yeah, this is not a petition. Is that from John? Yeah. Well, this is from three homeowners. Three, yeah. Six, eight, and five. And that's dated November 18th. Is that yeah. we were initially going to come from? Right. So okay. this is different. So. Okay. Yes, yeah, yes, that is different. Can, and maybe okay. Would you like a copy sure. for the record? Yes. So just so you know, there are 27 individuals and 20 households that signed on to this from Cullen Way, Hillside Avenue, and Tamron <clears throat> Lane. Okay. Um, so the great majority of residents on Tamron Lane have signed on. Um, in addition to that, um, I just wanted to mention that I personally believe that the transfer of density would alter the essential character of the neighborhood. Um, I did take a look at the assessor database. I was kind of curious about lot size. And throughout Tamarind, um, the end of Cullen, where we're talking about the addition of another single family home, and also on Greybird Farm Circle, all of the lots are from 0.9 acres up to into two acres. So I know there's been a lot of talk about this being a transition zone. Um, I want to just kind of mention that for those of us that live in these neighborhoods, this does not appear as a transition zone to us. Kingston Road, certainly, but once you're into the residential neighborhoods, the, the character of the neighborhood is, is very different. Um, than that. And so transferring additional density to that, I feel, would significantly alter the character of the neighborhood. Okay, Should I leave so, this with you? Yes. Okay. And do, does the, um, the office have a copy of that? Was that given to your office? I can take it. I can copy it. Again. Okay. Okay. Can oh, you get a we should copy probably. Mr. Passe, too, please. Thank you. We should look at it now. Can, can we look at it can now we see and then before it? Yeah. we give it to Barb? Oh, are you going to copy it right now, Bob? Is that what you're doing? I can't yeah. do oh. <laughs> you just pass it's, it's it, Dad. I just, just pass it. Yeah, we can just look, at, a look right. at it. Because <laughs> we have to make a decision. Yeah. Without are there any? Uh, I'm sorry. Are, was there anything else that you? That's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is, thank you. Are there any other members of the public who'd like to speak? Uh, Trevor, not 15 Tamron Lane. Um, I just want to echo what a few other people have said in regards to property values uh, in the neighborhood. 
Uh, the zoning ordinance states that a variance must not affect the public health, safety, or welfare. Um, and section 2283, Bravo 4, um, <coughs> talks about the values of surrounding properties not diminished. Um, I mentioned earlier that I don't completely agree with the appraisal um, that, that has been submitted to the board as exhibit four. And I would like to point out a few additional points out of the appraisal. Uh, before I get to that, I would like to remind the board of what was said earlier tonight. Uh, Mr. Grissett stated that he would preserve the integrity of the neighborhood by constructing a single home on Cullen Lane number 19 adjacent to his property on Cullen Way um, on the circle. This is inferring that his own proposed plan of this density does not preserve the integrity of the neighborhood. So just wanna let it be known that a lot of people feel as though the plan doesn't preserve the integrity of the neighborhood including Mr. Grissett himself. So, in regard to the appraisal, um, page three of the appraisal talks about possible diminished values. I'll paraphrase out of this. Um, the exact provision of the zoning ordinance where variance is required was not identified. Lacking this, the appraiser can only assume that um, this standard uh, would require that allowing the subject's proposed open space, single family development, and one additional residential lot similar to any other variance request would not result in diminished values for the surrounding properties. That doesn't sound like a conclusive appraisal of a property to me. That sounds like a best guess. Uh, secondly, on page four, at the bottom of the page, um, where it was mentioned that the appraiser spoke to Mr. Grissett in regard to the value of the homes that would be constructed. Um, it was stated that the addition of a quality residential development of this type, I don't know what that means. That's not clearly defined. I don't know how that's um, actually promised and, and acted upon. Uh, but I don't think that that should be a part of an appraisal either. Um, I think that the appraisal should have to <coughs> actually prove the home values by looking at adjacent properties in the, in the town, et cetera, of this size, this size home, this size property lot, and actually determine the value of those homes and how they compare to the value of the homes in our neighborhood. In my opinion, by accepting this, if the zoning board accepts this appraisal as valid, that this sets a precedent that a promise is an acceptable method of an appraised value of a property. That's all I have. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to comment? <coughs> Yes. It's very quickly a quick uh, response. I, I think the first point I have is that we need to be careful here. We are not talking about a use variance to allow an open space development, okay? Open space developments are required in that district on, a, on parcels that are greater than 20 acres, okay? The nature of an open space development is irrelevant to the consideration before the board tonight. The question is whether or not the density from, from six of the lots depicted on the yield plan in the NP zone should be allowed, should be transferred, as Mr. Eastman stated, for the purposes of the yield plan. So the, the, the nature of open space development, which again, is not the election of the, of the applicant, but is the requirement of the zoning issue, is, is a beef not with this application, but with the zoning ordinance itself and with the planning board who created it and the legislative body who, who adopted it. So that's the first issue. All of the concerns regarding right of way et cetera, are issues that Mr. Grisette is happy uh, to, to talk to the abutters about. Um, foundationally, I think these issues are more uh, appropriately considered in the planning context. I have reached out to the attorney for uh, Mr. and Mrs. Flaherty, and we have extended an olive branch to try to work through the differences that we have. But I really don't think those issues are germane to the variance request that is before the board right now, which again, is to determine whether or not we should have relief to allow the density transfer 
of the lots depicted in the MP in the, uh, on, the, on the yield plan. The argument that you heard that uh, suggested that because there are potentially other ways to develop this property, a hardship criteria is not met is expressly against what the Supreme Court has said. The Supreme Court in the Harborside Hotel case out of Portsmouth expressly said you cannot use it as a criteria. You cannot deny a, va a variance because, quote unquote, there are other things you can do with your property. That is why in 2010 the variance criteria changed. That is why the state legislator decided to, to enact the first test in the variance criteria. And that's why the real consideration is, does it make sense based on the special circumstances of these properties to apply this ordinance to those properties? And that's the correct standard, not this nebulous discussion of the ancient hardship criteria about whether there are other things to do with your property. That's totally irrelevant. And then finally, with regards to value, the standard is not, and I appreciate, we appreciate the perspective of the abutters and those people that live on Tamarind land and Cullen Way. And as I, I think we both tried to articulate tonight, the goal here is to discuss, find common ground uh, and, and make progress. But the irrefutable facts before the board tonight is that there's one expert in the room to, to summarize an appraisal process as a best guess is probably the most accurate way to summarize appraisals. There is no magic ball. Nobody knows precisely what a market value is in a theoretical, hypothetical context. The point is that you, you, the met you apply a methodology and you reach a conclusion. I didn't hear any evidence that challenged the methodology that was employed in the 40-page uh, uh, expert analysis, and I didn't hear any other evidence uh, beyond the belief and the hope that the, the, the neighborhood stays precisely the way that it is that would tend to suggest that property values uh, uh, will be diminished. This is remaining land of an old subdivision. It always had the potential to be developed. The use for which it's being put is permitted by the zoning ordinance. The individuals who bought property with a 75-foot right-of-way bought the property subject to the 75-foot right-of-way. Again, we are happy to discuss those things, but I would sub uh, respectfully submit that the variance criteria in this case, and especially considering the long analysis taken by this board in the first hearing, uh, are squarely met. Indeed, I think this is the, the reason why variance relief exists in New Hampshire. Thank you. May I ask Mr. Passe a question? Yes, you may. Mr. Passe. <laughs> Sir. You've... Uh, stated several times that any parcel over a certain size, I think you said 20 acres, must be. Can you indulge me and tell me where it says that in our zoning regulations? I'm happy to. Thank you. Because in... It's a footnote. 14 okay. years on this board, I've never had anyone say that. Well, it's a, well, it's a first time for everything, Mr. Pryor. There is, in fact... Article 4.3, Schedule 2, footnote Page. 19. Well, that, oh, it's, it's Article 4.3, Schedule 2, footnote 19, four where lots of record have a total combined area of 20 or greater acres, as is the, the open space development is required. Is required. 4-14. Is required unless waived by the planning board, yes. For proposed subdivisions of an existing lot of record, mm -hmm. having a total no, combined sorry. area of 20 or greater acres, open space development is required unless waived by the Exeter plan. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pratt. <clears throat> okay. So we've closed public session. We're in deliberation. Is I believe correct? so. Is, we did. Well, we, well, we, we need didn't to. do that yet. We Does anyone to. else want to comment? No, no. Mr. Passe's already wrapped okay. up. Yeah, we've All done right. That. We'll close public session, we begin that. deliberations. Okay. So the issue Any before thoughts? us is whether yes. we grant a variance to... Use the density. Use the from density from the NP zone and apply it in total to the development in uh, the R1 zone. I'm having I'm having difficulty with the term transfer because the property mm. that we changed uh, <laughs> this old age shock special exception is part of the whole project. So I don't know if transfer is the best word. Yeah, I, think I don't it, think it is. Is it eligible, maybe, is the better way to put it, to be used? Yeah, I would say to use the density from yeah. those yeah. parcels the in the calculation. District eligible to be used towards the density calculation. Yeah. All I would say yeah, is I, the word transferred is what 
the applicant has used? I would point I to the, the, I think the, uh, you know, our notice on the agenda actually does a nice job. I found that, who, <laughs> Barb, I assume you <laughs> did a really nice job of, of summarize, of doing good summaries of, with really it's difficult. But that says, It does say transferred, but it says to allow for the residential unit density permitted in the NP neighborhood professional zoning district to be transferred to an adjacent property located in R1. Um, actually, that will, the only comment I would make on that is I think that's a little different than what's being asked, which is to allow the density permitted in R1 to be applied. Yeah. Um, I think it's, to, yeah, to permit, no, really we is got, to no, we did that with the special exception. But we're not asking, the, the applicant isn't asking for the, N the use is density. Permitted. The they're use asking for the R1 density. Yeah. I think they're, they're asking to be able to use, to calculate density in the R1 zone no. <coughs> by including no. property located in the NP's zone. No, it's simply a matter, we've, we've said that they can have six Right. Residential units, part, part of six residential units in the NP. Right. Right? And now that is being, if we say no, okay, one of the ways to think about this is what happens yes, what happens no. Mm -hmm. If we say no, then they have to deal with the density that they can get out of the exist, out of the non-NP portions of the property. Right. They still, it's still over 20 acres even without the NP. They're still going to have to go through open space but they can't get the boost of the six units from the NP. So they will have uh, an open space development of smaller scale. number of units, smaller scale, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, if we say yes, then the yield plan goes forward with whatever it is, 16, 19 units. It's getting late. Um, 16 units. If we say no, then the yield plan is going to be something less than 16 units. We don't know exactly how much, but it'll be less than 16. It'll still be an open space development. It'll still be, well, maybe it won't be 20 acres. No, it will be. It will be. It will be. And I would note, I mean, I think a lot of the issues that were raised, I think very validly by the, by the abutters, yep. um, I think those still remain either way I mean even even right. if yeah, it's I, a I agree it's a difference between 13 and and the units and 16 or 19 17 or yeah um, I think those issues remain in their largely planning board issues right yeah right and yeah <coughs> so well largely said. but not exclusively did well, I hear you say I, most of the issues were raised that were raised are are well the my, my point my point yeah. being is that the the issues that were raised <clears throat> relate to having any an open space yeah. subdivision there. It relates to adding a bunch of condominium units in this case, whether the whether it's thirteen or seventeen, Seven. well, eighteen, sixteen or, or less. We don't know yeah. the number. We don't right. know the number that would be resulted well, because we don't have a yield plan that shows without. Um, I think the point that one of the abutters made uh, is that the transfer of density, this was a specific quote, transfer of density will alter the essential character of the neighborhood. Um, and I believe that abutter was making the case that the increase would alter the character of the neighborhood. I think that the whole thing alters the character of the neighborhood. Uh, by having 16 or 13 or 12 or 11 condominium units on a parcel that was designed for R1, despite the size of the property, really does change the nature of it. I mean, it's a very crowded area. There's a lot going on there. But that is, is the what, transfer of six yeah. making an appreciable difference. I mean, if you're talking about the, the increments, the, it's... The attorney said that that is the design of the open space provision, yeah. which is required for sites over 20 acres. And, it, it and that is not <coughs> the applicant's fault. That's the planning board's and the right. town's fault. Right. And the only thing we have to decide is the transfer of the six. So I'd, uh, I want to phrase it differently. And in, in, in one sense, um, if, if, the, if the area 
in discussion were R1 and not NP, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Correct. Right. Okay. So we go back to 7.5.3, which is the one that lists out the specific areas where you can have a uh, open space development. And the piece of property that they're using in the calculation doesn't meet the criteria to be part of an open space development. The open space development we're talking about here is the whole project, not just the little bit where they're shown. And, and so really what we need to do or what should have been requested is permission to use the now transferred residential now existing, NP. not yet transferred. And now permitted. Right. It's now permitted. Right. I'm not, it's not being included. And so, in fact, what we're trying to do, what they're trying to do is include the, what used to be NP and is right. now an R blank to meet the requirements of 753. And it, if, and it's you still could, an NP. It's still an NP. It just has six no. portions well, of six lots. Well, we've allowed, a no. we've allowed residential use. uses in an NP. It's still an NP. And an uh, NP allows an residential uses NP. by special exception, which we've granted. Okay. But <laughs> I, uh, my, I think my argument still applies whether you you consider the whole thing residential or just the bits and pieces that you needed to add on, those are now allowed to be part of the overall project by virtue of the special exception. By virtue of the special exception. There, there are, they are ours, but they're not our ones, twos, threes, or fours. And so the variance would be to allow the converted to residential parts of the six properties to be included in an open space development because they're not yet, because they are not a one, two, three, or four. Right. Okay. Can I okay. point everyone, maybe draw everyone's attention to page one of the variance application? in the bold second paragraph, I guess, because that's, I mean, that's the applicant specific <laughs> request. And maybe that, I would suggest that's what we should okay, focus what page on. Do you want? This is page one of the actual application. So it's, it's, it's the second oh, the page one or of the memorandum. Oh, okay. Memorandum. Yeah. You mean in caps? So what do you mean in caps? All you, caps, at the top. All caps at the top. not variance application four, but the next section that says they're requesting a variance from Zoning from Article 4.3, Schedule 2, and Article 7 to permit a single family open space development in the R1 zoning district, which draws density from a contiguous unimproved property in the neighborhood professional. Yes, there we go. There we go. We had it in front of okay. us all the time. Mm -hmm. Why do you say something? <laughs> yeah. Well, I would also just point to the application, for the actual page two, which also restates the language. We're not the, listening to you. <laughs> Okay. So is everyone, I mean, is yes. that, does well, that help sort of yes. clarify the <laughs> scope of what we're it does. reviewing? It's exactly what it we're does. trying to do. Okay. Okay. Um, do we want to go through the variance criteria? Do we want to have some discussion before we do that? What do people we better go through. I'd say we should. I say go through the criteria okay. and the discussion will take place in the context of the, okay. of the, of the variance. Okay. Um, okay, so the first requirement is that the variance is not contrary to the public interest. And the second, the spirit of the ordinance is observed, is generally, they're generally considered together. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is addressed in the application. 
and again the variance Pretty is well. not for an open space development the variance is for to draw density, draw density from, from contiguous from the, unimproved from the property right, from the NP. One to the other. Exactly. Okay. So it's in order to draw that density, in order to create this open space development in the residential six. zone. Excuse me? They will only be able to draw six from. Right. Or how many of ever we gave them is how many they're going to. Right. Gain. So they can't say 12 or they can't say seven. Right. It's going to be the six. six. Those six. As proposed. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, whether it conflicts with the explicit or implicit purpose of the ordinance does not alter, alter the essential character of the neighborhood, threaten public health, safety, or welfare. Um, I think the problems that people have with it are uh, with open, yes, open space developments more than it is with the drawing the density from the neighborhood. Because the drawing the density, what it does is it increases the number of units that are allowed to be built that's the practical implication so you're yes. talking about this as well additional as the three. preserved land in the open space yes right right, right. um yeah i mean I, it which is, is important because it it drags that piece in it and, is and limits its future use to conservation use right. basically right right i mean so, that's a really important factor i may disagree with the calculation used for 64 or 87 units or whatever it was which I don't think is or achievable. 2000. Or 2000. Right. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's going to the, remain the what it is. The fact of the matter is, is that that large parcel is going to be preserved. So that will remain, right. and the neighborhood, although it, it will still be a re residential neighborhood, it will have some, it will have condos in a certain area rather than single family well, probably homes. probably because they can't be built, but that's a different story. Okay, well, that's the proposal. That's my story. Um, <laughs> So I don't think it alters the essential character of the neighborhood. And I, I don't <coughs> think that the additional units would alter the essential character. Mr. Morrow, you wanted to finish that? But somebody in the planning board is going to make that decision on what they can do after us. That's yes, it, yes. it may well be that the, prop, that the parcel does not support 16 as far as mm -hmm. so we're giving him a water certain, or we're anything certain, else. Give, we're giving them a certain level based on what we are discussing, and they will give them a certain level on what they discuss. Based on technical review of the yeah. yeah. Well, and I, I, no, and I think that's important more because we made that in the, in the administrative appeal, but we are not reviewing whether, you know, this yield plan is you know, viable, et cetera, all of right. those criteria that will still go through planning board. Yes. We are just Ruby. giving them the six. We are just talking about the We're giving them the framework. The drawing the density from the, the NC. six that they have. Yes. Right. And abutters okay. may consider that a warning they're gonna have to go through this again. <coughs> I think they okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So sure it'll go much faster. essentially for the reasons <laughs> that are included in stated in the application, um, and what we've just discussed, I think that criteria one and two are met. The essential character of the neighborhood as a res remains, and it does not help threaten health, safety, or public <coughs> welfare. Um, as far, next is substantial justice. The benefit to the applicant should not be outweighed by the harm to the general public or other individuals. Um, I think the harm would be having a condominium development nearby to this area have some increased traffic. It sounds like the views are pretty much buffered. I don't know about I the word that condominium that really in that. I mean, I think it has to do with a dense development. They're going to be single okay. family homes. It's going to that's be a much right. denser mm -hmm. usage. And, and it is going to, and there are planning board issues as far yes. as the access to Tamron Lane the width of the road, the fact that it's mm -hmm. a private, who's going to maintain the road. Again, we're talking about the, the, the incremental, the NP, yeah. the, what right. that adds, yeah. not, so it the, adds not the overall concept. We don't know it's, exactly the impact of adding. It's not exactly six because there were not six uh, lots that were entirely contained within the NP. I, we don't know exactly what the I impact think the estimate be. was... It would, Approximately Three. 13 versus 17. Versus, right. Well, 16, so, yeah. 16 in this day, but the, the 17 <coughs> that separate one off right. the end, which would be carved out from Reset's existing property. So that's really treated separately. So the 
Oh, right. The property that? can be developed. The We're talking about I think the difference is probably yeah. three to four three to, units. Three, it's a guess, three to four units, 16 to 12. Right. And, and so the differential on... We're not talking here about not being able to build the project at all. Correct. It's right. how big the project is going to be, and only by three or four houses, balanced against being able to tie up that 30 acres of property and have that not developed at all. Right. Well, yeah. That's part of and it. Which is right, and we're talking about benefit to the public. Which that to me is, like a, you, is a large factor. Yeah, it's an envir environmentally sensitive area as well. So, yeah. All right. Um, the values of surrounding properties are not diminished. I, I don't think we really heard any information, anything to suggest that the values, anything concrete to suggest that the values would be diminished. We no, some anecdotal hear. evidence, but nothing. Right. Nothing concrete, and certainly nothing to offset the. Uh, Professional opinion. professional opinion that we received. Okay, so the next one hardship. Okay, literal enforcement of the ordinance would result in unnecessary hardship, which means one of two things. The first is that because of special conditions of the property that distinguish it from other properties in the area, one, there is no fair and substantial relationship between the general public purposes of the ordinance provision and the specific application to that property and that the proposed use is a reasonable one. I think the applicant and the applicant's attorney made a reasonable case for saying that that NP area that's 800 feet back from the road has, is, is still it's landlocked. It's landlocked, it has access issues, it's wetlands. Right. It, it, it's, it's somewhat unique. Unique and it is, would be beneficial to have it Right. used in this way as opposed to other ways. Right. Um, Are we setting a precedent on doing this? Well, no. we're dealing with a specific no. piece of property <coughs> in a specific location and a specific increment, a specific impact that it would have. So it's not... I do think there are special conditions with this particular property. I don't think it necessarily would apply to other properties. Right. It's pretty unique. Yeah. And the, the other thing is it, um, it is a, there is, we did have some reference to the master plan that the applicant brought up that it's, mm -hmm. gen, it's favored for property to be developed in this way and this would lend itself Given the environmental nature, given the location, given the distance from access roads, this is clearly a parcel of land that should be in conservation. Yes. Right. What's the best way to get there? Which is the consistent with the intent of the ordinance and right. the intent of requiring um, open space subdivisions for these large types of lots. And, yes. And the trade-off there is that the part that is developed is more dense. Right. Yeah, right. That's right. And that... Well, that's exactly right. And the difference here is, is that against the intent of the ordinance to include a portion that's in the NP district. I think the intent of the open space subdivision mm -hmm. requirements is to preserve land that really shouldn't be developed, either because we want to preserve, we want to preserve land in Exeter, <coughs> which this does, and because we want to preserve land that um, has, that is, you know, environmentally sensitive and is not appropriate for putting a bunch of house lots on. But we do need to further good development as well, and I think that that's, you know, the more dense development is being more encouraged now because mm -hmm. it does Preserve meet a, quite a number of objectives. Even when that takes place as an infill within an existing area of single-family homes. Okay. Um, I mean, this is an infill. Yes, it is. Well, is that our decision to make? <coughs> well, I think it's Jermaine Delora's comment that it, this is the type of development that is now being encouraged. I understand that. I, I would agree. It, its location is not optimal for that. Well, I don't know about that. I think that, that that's... Um, I mean, I think... It is buffered. There needs to be 
it's buffered. infill development. I don't, I don't, I don't think that this it's, is a terrible place for it. I, if I lived right next door, would I be completely happy about it? No, but I will note that there's a right to put a lot. I mean, it's, you know, it's 70. Uh, I mean, I, and I don't want to undercut the impact to, to the neighbor because uh, yeah, I get it. I do get it. Too. But I think it's, you know, it's uh, setback requirements, I think, are in the R1. Rear setbacks are 35 feet. Um, Well, they need to have a buffer for the... There's additional buffers. My point is that even as you could put a single-family house lot, if you put one single-family home, you could put it... Closer. Close. So, I mean, that's, I think that's a it's worthwhile a consideration. Yeah. Um, not to say it's, not, it's the same as you you know, mean putting the, all of these units in, but... The, the setbacks are smaller for a single-family home. Is that what you mean? I'd say yeah. for a single-family home in the R1... The front setback is 25. The side setbacks are, you know, 15 or uh, on one side, 30 for both, 25 rear. So this is buffered this a is, little more. This, this, is, is, this is has more buffer than that, and okay. it's not to say that <coughs> there's a right to put that. But you could put a single family home. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That close. Yep. Yeah. Well, you could put two of them. And you could put others. Side. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. And yes, there are going to be impacts that are greater than the single family home in terms of noise and light and traffic and all of those issues. And that's the planning board. It, to the, yes. yes. I mean, to the extent it goes beyond the nexus between right. the additional, right. the additional yeah. units okay. that we can that we're adding. And the other part of that is that the proposed use is a reasonable one, and I think we've addressed that just in discussing the um, well, proposed use is residential. Proposed use is residential, and it's in line with open space development, which is uh, encouraged well, well, and I it think preserves conservation land. The uh, <laughs> the note that he was he read to us before actually requires it for right. the chunk right. of land that so big. Certainly. It doesn't require the transfer of the right. six units from MP. Right. No. That's right. why there's a right. 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 Okay. It's going to be open space. It's how, how big is it going to be? <coughs> okay. So um, do we need, I don't know, do we do we need to discuss the second unnecessary hardship criteria? We okay. First. Do we have a motion? Who, it, who read like it? to make a motion? Kevin read Kevin, it last yeah. time. Did you find it yeah. again? It's on page one at the top. Second, yeah. Uh, if I, I guess I will make a motion to approve the requested variance from uh, Article 4.3, Schedule 2, and Article 7 to permit a single-family open space development in the R1 zoning district, which draws density from contiguous, unimproved property in the neighborhood professional zoning district. As presented in the application? As, yes, as presented in the application. Do we have a second? I'll second. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Aye. Okay, motion passes. The variance is granted. I had a chew on that one. For yeah, thank you. You guys don't give up. Go attack the planning board. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now you okay. Uh, now I. Yeah. So yeah, we're going to move on to the Laura next has one. To Do we need to have Laura's recusing herself? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great bridge uh -oh. properties. So we need either Mr. Merrill. Do you have another or, question? Uh, uh, we need one of the alternates. One of the alternates. Oh, yes. This is the Justin Pesce evening. Yes. Yeah, I've lost my Who's it? Who is it? Who's it? Who's it? Who's it? I'll vote on it. Okay. Chris is going to vote. Chris has got it. Is that okay? Okay. You're right, Esther. Yeah, okay. Chris has got it. All right. You mean if you're really Thank bored you. and tired, you can recluse yourself or whatever it is? Yeah, right. <laughs> nice timing, Laura. <laughs> yeah, I, can see yeah, I can't find my. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> So we're going to go right into the final, what will be the final matter for What's tonight. A rehearing on the application of Great Bridge Properties, LLC, for a special exception per Article 4, Section 4.2, Schedule 1, 
permitted uses in Article 5, Section 5.2, to permit the proposed a way to clean out a construction house. of a multi-use structure on the property located at Two Meeting Place Drive, <coughs> and a special exception from Article 4, Section 4.4, .4, Schedule 3, Note 12, to allow an increased height of said structure not to exceed 50 feet. The applicant is requesting a slight modification to the condition of approval with respect to the reference that the residential component of the project will be consistent with New Hampshire State Workforce Housing Statute Section 67458 at, at SEC. The subject property is located at C2 Highway Commercial Zoning District Tax, tax Map Parcel 55-75, case number 1915. Mr. Passe. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair. You mean we? You know, I thought we were done with you. <laughs> You're lucky that the wood burning. Let him finish. That's right. He was. Let him finish. So, uh, Justin Passe, on behalf of uh, Great Bridge Properties, here tonight with uh, Chris Davies for what I hope to be a very uh, quick uh, hearing. Uh, by way of brief overview, we are here in October. We got a special exception for the multi-use and for the height on the meeting place parcel on Epping Road based on a misunderstanding and basically you know succinctly my lack of articulation uh the condition that we agreed to that night was more cumbersome than we intended it to be um we then filed a motion for rehearing which was considered in november um and this uh, this board i think agreed basically with what we were trying to do but we had proposed in our motion for rehearing a slight adjustment to the language of the condition to basically require us to just comply with the affordable uh, language in the rent controls contained in the workforce housing statute instead of the broad language that was uh, initially approved by this board i've uh, i have um revised language to be uh, to reflect what we're hoping to be the proposed motion uh, on this uh, on this which reflects what I've just said everything is the same there's just a slight adjustment in the language about the workforce housing statement and again like I said in November the issue here was that you know as we uh, uh, go towards uh, financing this project which as everyone is aware is a very cumbersome and long process we want to be sure that the condition on the approval uh, that reflects that we'll be in, in adhering to the workforce housing uh, statute is perfectly clear and consistent. The problem with the first condition was that it, it appeared as though we were going to comply with the whole workforce housing statute, and the one part that we're not complying with is that we are not providing at least 50% uh, two two uh, bedroom residences. Our ratio is mm -hmm. different from that. So we didn't. We wanted to avoid a situation a year and a half from now when some investor says, "Wait a second, this, you're not complying with the condition." So now we have a new language that says that we will comply um, with the uh, the <coughs> income and rent levels that are consistent with those in the R and RSA 67458 um, in the affordable language, which is again a part of the statutory definition which we're happy to comply with, um, which will better capture the intention and be better for us long run. So I will uh, approach and provide. Thank you. Copy. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Is this different from the application? Uh, I literally just. Uh, Thank you. OK. The, other, the only other difference is that we added the word non-residential as, as to the first floor use, because if you remember, it's proposed to be commercial and also some like uh, storage for, for people living on the second floor. So again, we didn't want to imply that the entire first floor is commercial. There is a proposed commercial component to it. It just has this sort of accessory uh, use of potential storage, which was on the original site plan that we uh, provided. And then we changed the date to reflect tonight's uh, tonight's night. So October fifteenth was the date when it was approved. Fifteenth uh, approved five zero. Right. Okay. So your change the wording the di that's different is that is affordable in nature, using income and rent levels that are consistent with those defined in the statute. Mm -hmm. Correct. That's basically the change. So that's you it. want to no. commit to what the original intent was to use the affordability criteria yep, and not, I guess it, I think it included percentage. Is that what it was? Yeah. The issue, Just the, the, the first condition said that uh, three stories of residential housing pursuant to oh, New okay. Hampshire state work housing statute, which is very broad. So right. we just, just caveated it to say, we're going to comply with these provisions of this, of the work that is affordable statute. in nature. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I think I, you took yeah. the blame, but I think I drafted that, or I came up with that motion, so I take the blame on that well, one. Thanks. Um, blame to go around. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. We're good. Blame more than okay. I. Um, 
I can't find but, it. But uh, I mean, and, and it, it, that was consistent with what you know my intent was, right. which was just you, you guys had made it very clear that you wanted to make these, you know, you wanted to keep the rents affordable, and we right. were just trying to have a an objective guideline for right. that. So this. I have no issue with this. This is consistent okay. with my con my concerns. So how do okay. we do it? Yeah, okay. procedurally, we're not actually rehearing the entire application. We're right. simply we're just saying addressing that change right. in language. Right. Well, it is a rehearing, so I would, you know, I think we, but I think we can base it on the hearing of October. Base it on all, everything presented, you know, uh, and I think the, the record presented at the. Yeah, I think the agenda actually noticed instead for the purpose of considering a slight yeah. modification yes, to the condition. Yeah. Of we approval. were limiting it to yeah. yes. Okay, so did you want to speak or are you all set? Okay. Justin, yep. Okay, <laughs> and there are no Let's members of the public stick around present. For a while longer. Yeah. Just Laura. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions here? You have to put besides two meeting place. You have to put Exeter, New Hampshire, or anything like that in there. I was literally, uh, I was copying the original. I don't think uh, we did. The original condition. I mean, it has to be Exeter. Yes. Yeah. Well, or we wouldn't yeah. be here. Yeah. yeah. I'm just, <laughs> I don't we don't have any right here. I mean, I'd be happy to approve again, plenty of things in Hampton. We can but, uh, add really. that. It'd be we can it'd add be that. That's fine. So you probably <laughs> just. Okay. So. Did you get one of these? <clears throat> Madam Chair. Okay, so, so to be procedurally correct, we're closing public session and we're beginning right. deliberations. Okay. Madam yes. Chair, I would like to make a motion that we modify the conditions of approval previously granted on October 15th, 2019 for the application for a special exception for Article 4, Section 4.2, Schedule I, permitted uses, and Article 5, Section 5.2 to permit the proposed construction of a multi-use structure with first floor commercial slash non-residential and three stories of residential and rental housing, residential rental housing, that is affordable in nature, using income and rent levels that are consistent with those defined in RSA 674 colon 58 on the property located at two meeting place drive, Exeter, New Hampshire, and a special exception from article four, section 4.4, 4. 4, Schedule 3, note number 12, to allow an increased height of said structure not to exceed 50 feet. As presented. Second? I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. You're all set. Thank you for being so patient. So it's been a long night. Sorry. Okay. And thank you for this. Okay. Good. Good. If okay, you say, so, like I said one more time, I think I'm going to scream at you. I'm going to come out of this chair. It's as I, I said, not like I out. said. <laughs> not like I out. said, it's <laughs> as I said. Didn't they teach you anything in the Navy? No. <laughs> Can you swim? Other than to say bravo, which you did tonight. I did. I started swimming. Uh, I thought, uh, I, was, I was wondering how far you're going to go with the list. Okay. Uh, so uh, given the hour, we'll... Shall we, can we leave consideration of the minutes to next week? Please. Yes. Yes. Okay. Next, month. next meeting. Okay, next month. That's right. right. Next, not next week. Uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? Yeah. Motion to move. Second it. All in favor? Thank you. Aye. Aye. Uh, adjourned. There we go.